Guys, my guest this week, uh, Jeremy Miner, uh, introduced uh, the two of us together, and I started doing a bunch of research. I didn't know him, which is crazy because you live in the same city yeah. as me. I can't believe we haven't bumped into each other. Uh, and I saw some of the craziest stuff I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I, I just, it's it's indescribable. Uh, at certain points during this video, I'm going to tell you guys to stop the video and go watch some other <laughs> stuff that he does. But it's pretty amazing. It's impossible to describe. But he is a mind hacker. He's a hypnotist. He's a mentalist. He's got 900,000 subs on uh, YouTube and over 1.7 million on TikTok because of the stuff that he does goes incredibly viral. It is Mr. Max Major. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, I'm great. Awesome, man. Uh, so a couple things. Can you explain to, for a lot of people, because they're going to look at yourself in, initially and say magician, but it's not a right. magician. You're a mentalist. Can you, yeah. can you go over the difference here? It's magic of the mind. That's yeah. the best way to, to look at it and to think about it. And I actually started as a magician when I was a kid, and we can get into that story as well. Yeah. But over the years, I transitioned to being more interested in like influence and hypnosis and how you know, people's thoughts can be shifted and how that in and of itself can be magic. Because I think our minds are magic. So I was really obsessed at a young age of the psychology piece of magic. So I was doing, you know, card tricks, whatever. I was 12, 13 years old. But magic, it, it teaches you kind of like a foundation in psychology. And that's what I found so interesting was the way that the mind could be fooled or the way that you could control attention. Magicians call it misdirection, but it's really about controlling attention. Um, but then I started learning hypnosis and started studying influence and body language in it. It changed the way I performed and I sort of shifted my focus from like sleight of hand and props to doing magic of the mind. And so in a way, people are kind of my props. And that's been something I've kind of explored for the last 20 plus years of my life. Well, the thing that really made me interested in this was mm -hmm. when you go on America's Got Talent and you get all the people to draw the same drawing. So you guys have to see it. I would recommend pause right now. Go watch, <laughs> watch his segment on America's Got Talent where you get all those people to make the same drawing. And the thing about it is afterward, then you explain how you did yeah. it through the concept of... of um, to this idea of, uh, you said inception before, but like suggestion. Yeah, like subliminal messaging, which is a topic people used to talk about in the yes. 80s and 90s, and it kind of left yeah. pop culture and awareness, but there's no doubt that like it's real. messages are being put into everything it, we see every day. And yeah. if anything, the fact that they stop talking about it should concern you because yes. we have technology we didn't have then. We are attached to our devices and we're consuming all of this information and that information can be laced with an agenda. I mean, look, the bottom line is, these things work because if they didn't, then no company in the world would spend any money on marketing, yes. right? So it's possible to shift people's behaviors, their actions, their opinions, their decisions. That's the essence of, of marketing. Um, and you can do it with and without someone's information or, yeah. or knowledge. So Yeah, it is, it is frightening when you consider that because whenever you ask people, does the media fool the, the populace? Everyone raised their hand and says yes. And you say, does the media fool you? Mm. And no one raises their hand. Mm. And it's like they don't come to the realization of the stimulus. That's one of the things I do study in psychology yeah. is that the, how much stimulus affects our behavior. Oh, that's so interesting. Everyone agrees that it works, but they say it doesn't, doesn't work, work on, on me. Yeah. I've heard something similar with marketing is the reason marketing works is because everybody says it doesn't work on me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's very that's similar. So I've never thought about it, but of course that's true. The irony is it's the girl who says all those other girls are like this, but I'm different. Or mm. often when we, when we try to sell guys who work in telephone sales, yeah. they often join our program because they're like, oh, you know, this would never work on me, but it works. <laughs> it's really one of the ironic things. I'm open to the fact that if you consistently showed me images of something, I would start to think of that thing. I'm yeah. open to that. I don't believe in this kind of like, obviously we're the, we're, um, is part of our evolution to where when we consistently see stimulus, we're going to adjust to that stimulus. We have yeah. to. And also, I, the thing that I think that you do that's absolutely fantastic is Homo sapiens are uh, they're they're they have an ad evolutionary adaptation for pattern recognition, mm -hmm. and you use that mm -hmm. a lot of times to get people to see things or hear things or or that's or, a big part yeah. of hypnosis yeah. is that people fall into predictable patterns, and so if you can break that pattern or that expectation of what's going to come next, it creates almost like a short circuit in the thinking mind yeah. where the brain has never encountered this situation before and it doesn't have an automatic process because we run so much of our lives on autopilot, which is, is a good thing in yeah. a way because it allows us to not have to think about every decision, every moment of the day. We're also born with information because if we weren't, then we would have to learn all of the lessons that our ancestors learned over and over again. Yeah. We would never, we would get like decision fatigue. We would never get anything done in a day. So for most of the time, in our life that that doesn't backfire on us it's a really helpful shortcut to just automate decisions for things that appear all the time right um, so like as an example you, you meet someone in public they extend their hand right yeah and you go for a handshake and then yeah. all of a sudden your hand is in front of your face yeah now, unless you've been hypnotized before you've never been confronted with this situation yeah. before and you probably felt it in yourself for a moment well, what the hell yeah. is going on right it reminds me of jujitsu actually 
Yeah. yeah. So, so that's just one example of yeah. many. That's one that people have probably seen in hypnosis, but that's an automatic behavior. There is no middle to a handshake, right? So just, yeah. we'll exaggerate it for a yeah. second. There's no middle to a handshake. There's yeah. just like the initiation and then, oh, it yeah. always concludes this yeah. way. Never in your life has someone gone for a handshake and then put your hand in front of right. your face. Right, yeah. And so when this happens, when you're met with the, you're in the middle of running a script, your brain is running a program that's very helpful, doesn't have to think, oh, what do I do? He's got his hand out, right? It's just automatic because every point in your life that someone's ever extended their hand, the ending is always the same. It ends in a handshake, right? Now when suddenly you're confronted, the program stops running and the brain goes from being an autopilot to, oh shit, I don't know what to do next. What mm -hmm. is this? We don't have a, a branch for this in the script. And that creates a little window in the thinking mind right? Where I can now speak directly to the subconscious. So if in that moment I were to give a direct suggestion, then usually your subconscious would take hold of that because it's looking for an instruction. It's like, I don't know what to do next. Just tell me what to do. And so if I say the word sleep or eyes closed or whatever it is, that suggestion will be yeah. taken. So that brings us back to this conversation about our patterns. It's really, it's really helpful. You know, like the way that we work and the way that influence works and the way that our thoughts create our reality, it's not a weakness. A lot of people think that to be hypnotized, um, it's a sign of a weak personality yeah. where you have to be very gullible or well, stupid. Well, a lot of guys are like, this would never work on me. That's the first thing they say. Right. Without looking up anything, even when you had, uh, when you talked to Drewski, yeah. it's like, this would never work on me. Yeah. Right. That's the first thing. And my initial thought is like, you know, being former military, or whatever, this would never work on me. But then I watch and I'm like, the more I study psychology, it's like, no, you're just, a, you're, you're a function of your biology and your, in the stimulus that you receive. And your inner world. Yeah. And so what I was getting at is that your, your thoughts create your reality. And while this could be perceived as a weakness it's actually our superpower mm. as humans yeah right so so this this when you grab my hand this brings you into the present moment and mm -hmm. it's a pattern interrupt like my man Jeremy, our friend jeremy minor talks about using pattern interrupts to yeah, sort of that's break a term that. from hypnosis so it's yeah. really interesting he uses that in yeah. sales yeah. yeah we we used to i used to use the term break and rapport but pattern interrupt so pattern interrupt is like because you know i discuss dating a lot on the show yeah a uh, pattern interrupt is the guy goes up to the girl in the valet and he's like hey good to meet you he's like hey i was wondering if you you know we could have dinner sometimes and she blows him off and then like a fucking rolls royce phantom pulls up and then all of a sudden she's like, wait, what? And she's like this. Or a guy's talking to a girl in the bar and then and she's like barely annoying him. And then a, an even hotter girl comes up and kisses him on the cheek while he's talking to that girl. Yeah. That's a pattern interrupt. Those sure. pattern interrupts are, are things that get that sort of like break this um, mold or this uh, dynamic that a lot of times women have with men that they are go constantly into autopilot. Approaching. You know, exactly you just right. constantly ask for your phone number and it's just like, no, sorry, I'm trying to have lunch. What's yeah. going on? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a program that makes life easier. Yeah. Um, but yeah, our thoughts create our reality. So think about it this way. If you're the type of person that walks around and every day you think, I'm so unlucky, bad things always happen to me. Mm. I can't believe this is happening again. What does your life look like? Yeah. Right? You see all of the problems and tend to attract more of that stuff into your life because you always find what you're looking for, right? If by contrast, you walk around and you think, I'm so lucky, good things always happen yeah. to me. I can't believe Gratitude. this is happening again. What's your life look like? Yeah. Right? I got chills. I did it, hypnotized myself just them. So our thoughts create our reality and it begins with the stories that we tell ourselves. Yeah. Right. And a lot of times those stories are not ones that we're even aware of. Um, it could be something someone said to us that shaped the way that we perceive ourselves. You know, maybe it was 20, 30 years ago. I've worked with people in uh, um, private hypnosis sessions where I help them overcome the limiting beliefs that they have. And sometimes, you know, someone can be in their 60s or 70s and they're still reliving, you know, or living based off of a program that was installed when they were 10 or 11 years old because of some trauma that happened to them. And if we don't stop once in a while to just like notice the stories that we're telling ourselves and then to ask ourselves, is this story even true? Is it useful? Is it helpful? Does it serve us anymore? And was it even our idea to begin with, right? Then we continue to live our life according to the programs from when we were a child. Right. And so it's really helpful to once in a while just like slow down and look at the conversations you're having with yourself and, you know, ask, how do I, how do I face challenges? And you know, what have I struggled to change over the years? What's something that I haven't been able to get past? And then once we realize what that is, well, why? Why is that? Well, what, how is it serving us? You know? Yeah, my buddy Home Math talks about thinking about thinking, and then just mm. thinking about thinking. He's a uh, he studied uh, so important developmental uh, psychology, and he's a, yeah, and he he goes over those concepts. And one of the things is like, where do I have a weakness? I, I remember one time I I was I had a business partner, and he told me to not like this guy. And then when I stopped working with a business partner who ended up being like a fraudster, I still didn't like the guy. And then one day I started asking myself, like, why do I not like this guy? And then we're now we're friends. Oftentimes, like people who play games don't like to be seen. Yeah. So if your business partner was a 
fraudster. Yeah. He probably didn't like that guy because he doesn't like people who see him for who he is. That's exactly what it was, too. You know, yeah. Most likely. Definitely. Have you looked up a uh, reticular activation system? Because no. I know you talk about NLP. Yeah. Can you go over that, like how, how NLP has uh, influenced you? This is something I... Yeah, I, so NLP is very similar to hypnosis. Yeah. I mean, I would say in many ways it's the like godfather of NLP. Mm. Hypnosis is more over, like you know when it's happening, usually. Uh, it's a lot of times done with the eyes closed. It's done you know, for therapeutic reasons, done for performance reasons, it's done for self-hypnosis, it's done for entertainment purposes. Like hypnosis, whether you see it on stage or in a hypnotherapist's office, is the same toolkit. The only difference is the intent. So like a hypnotherapist, you might be going there under the intent of like changing something about your life, and their intent is to help you facilitate that change, right? Uh, on a stage hypnotist, you, the goal is to be entertained. And so you're going there to, to be entertained, to learn something about yourself, to see your friends. But it's the same mechanism for me to give you a suggestion that you'll never smoke again as it is to give you a suggestion that you think you're a chicken or you quack like a duck or do something yeah. weird. And so NLP is an extension of that. It's just an understanding that our words have the ability to influence people's beliefs. Um, it's just done a little more covertly. Yeah. So I would say like most of... NLP is based off of hypnosis or an understanding of hypnosis. Have you, do you know who Ross Jeffries is? Mm -mm. Uh, he's like the first, the first time a lot of us had ever heard of NLP yeah. is back in the 80s and uh, 90s. He was talking about this stuff, but it, they, were, he, they were using it in the dating context. They were like getting people over their own limiting beliefs and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So I thought it was really interesting. But here's something else I want to know. It's like when I watch you sometimes do the hypnotism stuff. Yeah. And it's very fast. And at least from the videos that I see, it feels like it works on everyone all the time and it works very quickly. Uh, the dangers of this, not for you specifically, because I don't think you have any malintent, but another person walking around who's like trying to get girls to sleep with them or, or mm. rob people of their money, it feels like, and I, you know, I don't, when you, when you talk about NLP, I've met a bunch of people who practice it. I've never seen anybody as effective as you. So I'm just curious, this kind of thing, is it, is it possibly a danger if somebody else were to figure this out? Um, they've already figured it out. And again, it's being used in every aspect of life. So you think you like advertisement, stuff like that, or, yeah. or, the, or the media? Yeah. I mean, there were studies done around mind control and hypnosis, you know, years ago. And yeah. those studies stopped MK yeah. ultra, if you yeah. want to look it up. Um, but there's no reason that they wouldn't have continued to this day, because why would you not continue to research the impact that your words and language can have on people either at a conscious or subconscious level? So yeah, I mean, influence has been used as long as we could communicate to try to get people to do things we want them to do. And the only question is like intent, right? Like what is this person's goal? Is it to make you realize something about yourself or empower you or to take advantage of you? But a big piece of being able to hypnotize someone is that intent that comes through from me. Okay. So part of the reason I'm able to hypnotize people so quickly is because of that positive intent, right? So, yeah. it, so if we wanted to break it down a little bit, um, the way that a person can be hypnotized is by establishing very quickly three things. And those three things are confidence, rapport, and trust. And I picture it as a triangle with confidence at the top, right? And to break down each of those pieces, you, you can kind of see how this could work in sales or in business too, if you want to apply that lens to it. But this is how I think of it in terms of hypnosis. So Confidence is the first piece. That's before you even walk up to this person. And I used to think that the confidence piece meant um, their confidence in me, right? Their belief in me as a hypnotist and my abilities. But it turns out that over the years, what I've come to understand is that's my confidence. So the confidence piece has nothing to do with them. Yeah. It's strictly me and my understanding and my knowing that I'm the greatest hypnotist in the world and that I can hypnotize anyone and that this person's going to go. And they feel that. That comes through, right? Um, there, there's a really like interesting lesson you learn as a magician when you're very young. It's like, let's say I have you put your hand out and then I put a playing card in your hand and you, you think it's like the ace of spades and I put it in your hand, but I, I've switched it and you don't know that I've switched sure. it yet. And then a little bit later, we're going to reveal that that's now the queen of hearts or something, right? Yeah. As an early magician, I am worried you're going to turn that card over. You're going to be a bad spectator and you're going to look yeah. before I'm ready. And the lesson that you learn as a magician is to forget that that card even exists, which is really strange because you want to learn like sleight of hand and these tactics, but this is almost like a psychological play. Because if you look at it, then I'm going to look at if it. If I, in the back of my head, am thinking, don't turn over the card, don't turn over the card, don't turn over the card. Wow. What's the first thing that person's going to do? You're going to set it in their hand and they're going to go, oh, that's not the ace. What'd yeah. you do? Yeah. Right. I got you. And so you learn that like, in order for that not to happen, it's not anything you say, it's just literally you stop thinking about it. You pretend the moment you place that card in your hand, you just pretend it doesn't exist. And they feel that. 
It's yeah. something we feel. It's, it's that energy. It's that intent where if I'm nervous or concerned about it, they're going to feel it. And so it's kind of the same thing with hypnosis when you're first learning is that like if you're nervous that it's not going to work or if some part in the back of your head you're worried about it, your effectiveness is going to be really low. It's this like intangible thing that even if you follow the script and you say everything I tell you to say and you do everything with your body, it's that energy inside of you that they can feel. This guy's not really confident in his words and what he's doing. And they can feel that. So confidence is the first piece, and that starts with you. And so that's an understanding that, like, if you want to translate it to sales, it would be like, um, you know, I'm capable, I'm competent, I'm going to serve this person. It's like your internal state before you begin. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So the other piece of the triangle is rapport. Rapport is between the two of you. Mm. Um, really classically part of sales, right? But it's like my ability quickly to engineer a situation where you feel comfortable talking to me. Now, I do this a lot on the street in Las Vegas. And what's the first thing that you think when somebody walks up to you on the street in Las Vegas? It, it, well, because it's Vegas, gonna cost? how much is it going to cost? Right? Or you're some kind of performer, exactly. a meme or something like that? Or Immediately, so, yeah. they're yeah. like, how long is this going to take? How much is this going to cost? Yeah. I don't want to tip you, you know, because there's a culture of street performing here, which actually works a little bit against you yeah. as a hypnotist, because I don't go out with the intent of like getting tips or soliciting money. I just do it for, for people to have a fun experience yeah, themselves, sure. to learn something about their minds and yes, to make content at the same time. But initially like that, you have to recognize what their internal dialogue is and I have to diffuse that. And so sometimes I'll say things like, oh, this doesn't cost any money. I'm not performing for tips. I'm just doing this for fun. Do you guys want to explore your mind, see something cool, learn something interesting? And it kind of lets their guard down and immediately it's like two friends having a conversation and they have that comfort level with you. So rapport is between you and the last piece is trust and trust is entirely on them. The subject of the hypnotist is their trust in you. So confidence is all you, trust is all them, rapport is between you. Now the last piece of it that is optional, but that I think is what allows me to hypnotize people so quickly and with high, such a high success rate is something that lies in the center. And I call that presence, but you might think of that as intent. And the way that I do that is to turn myself over fully to the experience with them. You mean like the power of now presence. Yeah. Like so I am nowhere else. Awareness. So yeah. I'm, I'm nowhere else. Like when I'm yeah. standing with that person on the street, even if there's a crowd around me, because that happens really quick when you hypnotize someone and lay them down on the ground, you yeah. get a mob around you, like one of those breakdancing groups, you know? Um, but it's, it's just me and them and there's nothing else. And it's not something I'm pretending to do or something that you can really teach. It's just with repetition and with the intent of being there present with them, because presence is really disarming. Like most people are not used to having someone's full attention, Yes, especially today with cell phones and our distracted life. And if you think about Vegas with all the distractions around you, it's probably the most challenging place in the world to hypnotize someone because there's so much action. Maybe Times Square, I would say, competes yeah. with that. There's so many sounds and sights. Um, so when suddenly like you give them your pure presence, they're like sucked into that moment with you. Um, and I think that piece is what allows you to really get in. So that gets back to the conversation about intent. And I think it is that positive intent that comes through that makes people so willing to participate where when someone has an agenda or they're doing something selfishly, then you don't feel as inclined to want to participate. And you might not even be able to put your finger on it or be able to describe it, but some part of you, some alarm is going off that says, I don't really know about this. I don't know if I trust this guy. And that's that piece of the puzzle that allows it to work. So can it be used for evil? Of course. But like all things, I think information is power. Sure. And because all hypnosis is self-hypnosis, it's really important to understand how this works and what the mechanism is. So saying it wouldn't work on me is true because you are literally hypnotizing yourself. Ah, your thoughts are creating your reality. Yeah. So if you say, Max, you can't hypnotize me, guess what? You are correct because you hold a belief in your mind that is creating your reality. If you say, you know what, um, maybe I'm open-minded. Maybe I'd like to see. Maybe it's something I don't understand. Maybe I'd like to explore my mind. I'm open-minded. That's a different scenario, right? So if you believe you can't, of, of course you can't. But one of the things you can do, it's not impossible to hypnotize someone who says, sure. you can't hypnotize me. When you're confronted with the ego, you can either play to the ego or you can kind of like attack it you know, push up against it. So you could say something like, what are you scared? You know, oh, no, I'm not scared. Right. Or you could say something like, you know, for most people, you know, they think that in order to be hypnotized, you have to be really dumb, but it's actually the opposite. That's true. It's you have to be really smart. So the only reason you couldn't be hypnotized is if you're a dummy and you're not a dummy, are you? <laughs> yeah. Right. And immediately, go. oh, no, I'm not stupid. Of course. So you'd probably be really good at it. Yeah. So now I'm playing to the ego, right? I'm telling them you'd probably be really good at it. Yeah, I would be good at it. Yeah. yeah. You know what? I'm not a dummy. I'd like to try. I'm not yeah. afraid. Um, so you, you can combat that. It's not impossible, but it does point out the fact that our thoughts create our reality.
Yeah. yeah. Did, one of the things I, I noticed, so if you guys watch uh, with, when you go to the AMP house or when you're talking to Kai Sinet, uh, by the uh, one thing I noticed, besides the tricks, obviously I can't figure out what you're doing, <laughs> but the thing was that they acted like they'd known you forever after yeah. about 10 minutes in the thing. Like they were very comfortable mm -hmm. with you guys touching each other and bumping into yeah. each other and they were screaming. And it was one of these things where it was like you were so, you had such frame control. Yeah, it's and, not my show, and there's 200,000, 250,000 people watching live. Yeah. But somehow I'm in control of that broadcast. Yes. And that's intentional. But they didn't know. But my point is, because yeah. I have this question all the time, because I, I teach a they networking course. They didn't know course. anything about me. They yeah. didn't even know what I did. They'd mm. never even seen a video clip of me on the internet. Yeah. Um, literally, like his manager suggested that I would be good for it. And yeah. He was open minded and trusted him and said, sure, bring him in. And in their head, they thought, oh, it's just some magician coming in. Yeah. And they didn't know I had a whole journey I was going to take them on. But that's also a credit to them as streamers, because I think like the best streamers in the world are really present. And like they don't have a filter at all. And so their ability to be comfortable and treat me like a best friend when I walk into their world is also a credit to Kai Sinat being one of the best streamers in the world. Because yeah. if you watch him go out on the street and stream, they'd call it IRL streaming, where they have the camera wirelessly on the street. Everyone he meets on the street instantly becomes his best friend. And that's, that's a credit to him. And that's his confidence, rapport, and trust. That's his ability to build rapport with a stranger, to treat them like an equal, for them to feel his positive intent coming through. Because that guy just oozes fun and positivity and exactly. childhood wonder and all that kind of stuff, joy. Um, so credit to them as well. That's why they're the best streamers currently is because they just are themselves 24 seven, whether the camera is on or off and they treat everyone that comes into that house as a friend, as an invited guest is welcome. Um, although I will say I've now been on with Kai three times and the energy is shifting. Like each time I come now, they are becoming more and more challenging. Yeah, of course. Towards me. That would seem like that. Yeah. It was unexpected to me um, because the first time I well, went in there. Well, well, consider this, though. Yeah. In response, the last two ones, yeah, you are showing yeah. absolute and complete dominance yeah. over people. It's escalating. Exactly. But like in, in order for them to, to get garner back status, because regardless of how much money we make, I know some people like get, make fun of themselves or whatever. Homo sapiens are always looking for higher status and higher mm. sexual selection. And in this I don't want to be fooled. Yeah, in the, in this yeah. case, because it's not that that they don't like you, but you've shown total dominance over them <laughs> over the first two times. So yeah. I can I can see how that would happen. Yeah, and the most recent one too, they had a ton of huge streamers uh, and YouTubers from the UK and the US, and so the it was like twenty people in the room, and the energy was very much like we're gonna get him, yeah. and not in a mean spirited way. It was just like I'm gonna I'm gonna catch it this yeah. time. Uh, but I think that's what makes, for me, live streaming so fun and interesting is because in every other instance of performing magic throughout history, like on video, it's been recorded and edited. And the thing about Twitch is it's live. So yeah. whatever happens, happens. Whatever choice somebody makes, if they choose to turn over that card and look at it too early, yeah. that's forever. That lives on the internet, right? And so there's no net. There's no way to know ahead of time how it's going to go. It's also not like this where the cameras are in these specific places. Yeah. The cameras are moving around. There's people filming from all angles. Um, it's a really challenging environment to perform in, but also I think it's what makes it so fun. And so if you do choose to go and watch one of those performances of mine, I think it's really unique in that it's the closest experience you could possibly have to seeing me perform live. It's as if you were in there with the room yeah. with us. So, yeah. so when you watch comedians, yeah. they'll, they'll have a notepad. I've actually seen comedians that go up on stage. Yeah, so they'll have like a notepad a and they'll work on jokes that yeah. they don't think are that funny. Mm. And so what will happen is you'll see a lot of big comedians. <laughs> they'll have everyone. They'll take everyone's phone and they'll just like bomb. And they, they know there's like, okay, this one doesn't work. This one doesn't work because they have to try some new stuff. Yeah. In your situation, I feel like that could be risky because there has to be a point. Comedy is similar in a way. You're just making me think of something that yeah. I've never thought of before. Comedy is similar in a way to like mentalism because you can write something and you don't know if it's going to work until you try it on the mm. audience. Where like a magic trick, you can practice in isolation. Like you can practice the sleight of hand, shuffling the cards, making the thing disappear. You can do it in the mirror. You can watch it in the camera and you can know before you ever show it to another homo sapien, to yeah. use your term, yeah. you can know it's going to work. Yeah. Where with like comedy, even if you've been telling jokes for 20 years, you might think something's going to be funny and then it just completely flops. And I think mentalism is the same thing in that I can't practice it alone. You can't learn hypnosis in your bedroom. Yeah, that's my you point. You have yeah. to go out and try it on strangers, yeah. which is 
makes it really difficult to learn, but also really fun and exciting. So yeah, do I think where you were getting was like, do I do new material? How do I test new material? Yeah. You kind of have to try it on people. And so that's why I live here in Las Vegas is because I think it's the world's largest like lab. It's like a human Petri dish. So, so what you know? I'm saying is, are, are there hard drives full of stuff where you screwed up to like trying some of these? Well, usually I'll try it like not on camera for the first time. Yeah, okay. So I'll do it um, on the street. We might record it as a test, you know, and if it doesn't work, figure out why, if it's not interesting, because sometimes something's just not interesting. You like think it's interesting and it works, but it's like just not interesting. Um, that's kind of like the joke that's just not funny, but yeah. you technically it's, you know, works uh, on paper. And then also it's just like, if it doesn't work, it's figuring out why it didn't. So we might go back and look at the footage or talk about it or, you know, think about, well, how could I approach that differently? Or if they weren't hypnotized, why? And what did I do that maybe broke the trance or what happened? Um, what didn't I see? And so I do live streams about once a month where I, it's basically all experimental. Um, we go out on the street with a backpack and I just try do things ever stuff. go bad on the live streams. Well, I wouldn't say they go bad because it's, it's all the process. It's all yeah. part of the process. It's not like you, you know, pick a card and then you like see me palming it and the magician's busted. It's more just like what I mean is my like influence doesn't work. When or, you're pounding your hand on those bags with one of them has a nail. When I do it. something really dangerous, yeah. I try to think through all the outcomes yeah you know um but you can't always know and then there are times when like i will try something for the first time on a live stream that i've never done before because it can i it can kind of only work in that scenario and in that case like agt is a great example that performance i did i don't know how many people watch america's got talent when it's live it's like 12 million people yeah. or something or 10 million i don't know what the numbers are um but millions of people are watching that live i can't have practiced that of course it's, it's that was a very strange season. It was where everyone was home for the government shutdown yeah. and they were watching from like, they zoomed the audience in so there was yeah. no studio audience. I don't have a way to test if I can influence 200 people over Zoom like without doing it on the show. And so I had to do it for, we rehearsed where I'd be standing and what I'd be saying and where the camera would be looking and all of that. But I can't know the outcome ahead of time. But that's part of like what makes it exciting to be a live performer is like taking risks and knowing like, when the risk is worth it and what's going to happen if it doesn't work i'm be off the show but you know if it works it's going to be pretty cool <laughs> do you have a group of guys that you can talk to or mm -hmm. other performers where yeah. they could watch your yeah. your whole performance they know how you've performed every single one of the tricks and if you something doesn't work cuz you probably could have the conversation with somebody outside this space yeah. is there a is it, what is it a reddit group like how do you guys <laughs> how do you guys know do you text david yeah, blaine like we, how does this work it's like a very small circle of friends we don't all live in the same city some live here in vegas yeah but yeah we text we facetime we review videos together we grab coffee and just come up with ideas last night for example a yeah. friend of mine who's a magician came over to the house i have you know a book collection of, of you know obscure i have a book about hypnosis that i just got from 1899 yeah it's like one of the earliest textbooks on hypnosis and what at the time was believed to be the proper way to hypnotize someone yeah and so we'll look through old texts and we literally had a book night we just comb through these stacks and stacks of these old books that are falling apart that I have. And we'd find things like, wow, look at this. I've never seen anybody do this in a hundred years. Like we should try that, you know? Um, so yeah, we look at old books, we brainstorm, we come up with ideas from scratch. You know, it's like a body of collected information. It's like a tool set. So you can have an idea um, and then you can say, okay, well, how would we pull that off? So sometimes it comes from something from the past. Other times it comes just from the seed of an idea. It's like, well, wouldn't it be cool if we could do X? Well, how would we achieve that? And then we try different variations on that. But so I guess what I'm asking is, are they ever stumped? Do they ever, um, are they ever watching yeah. yourself or are they, are yeah. they so advanced? No, I, you can always be fooled as yeah. a magician or a mentalist in the business. We call that getting burned. Yeah. So like when another magician or a mentalist shows you something and you have no idea how it works. It, it doesn't happen a lot. It's a feeling you've kind of lost because yeah. that's what drew you to it as a kid. But then as you learn too much, you stop being uh, kind of fooled. So yeah, we call that getting burned and it's a great feeling, but it's kind of, ooh, it burns because it's like, oh, I don't know. And yeah. you, you want to ask, how did it work? But at the same time, you're like, no, let me simmer on that for a day because I haven't felt that in a long time. And sometimes you never want to know. Like yeah. you just want to go, you want to stay in that wonder. Like I remember seeing David Copperfield make a car appear on stage in the most like impossible conditions. He had like yeah. people all the way around it, holding a giant piece of rope and giant bright lights. And you could see above it from the seats in the crowd. He had two guys below, you know, looking up and every angle is covered and he throws this sheet up and he whisks it away. And there's a, a car, like a full size yeah. car with the wheels turning. And you're like, where did this come from? And I went back to the show, you know, years later. And I was like, I was probably sitting too far back to know how this was done. And I sat in the front row with my brother and I'm like leaning forward and squinting my eyes, like I'm gonna catch it. And it's like, 
nothing, 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 fucking car. And you're like, where did it come from? You know, and I don't have any desire to know how that's done. I mm. love the feeling of like going, wow, that's just it's beautiful that he came up with that and was able to create that. Well, well then that would go to my next point because a lot of David Copperfield's older tricks mm. have been explained. There's mm -hmm. YouTube videos that show them yeah. like that. Is that something that you're ever concerned with? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, especially with what I do. Yeah, because like, what you do I is I just like, told yeah. you how hypnosis works. Yeah. Confidence, rapport, and trust. And you could watch like a three hour workshop explaining that and learning how to, and you can still be hypnotized. So it's very different with what I do. It's a trick, but the trick is psychology. Yeah. The trick it's is like, in, it's like learning science. how the brain works in human nature, but just because you understand how you work, it doesn't mean it's not going to work on you because yeah. that's our wiring. You know, that's why we're able to watch a movie and f we know it's not real, but suddenly we're having this real emotional reaction inside of us. And we're like crying when, you know, old yeller dies or whatever. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Uh, whatever happens, <laughs> you know, because like for that moment in time, we're, allowing that to become our reality and it's making us feel real things and having real reactions and responses inside of our body but our body doesn't actually know the difference between a real experience and imagined yes. experience so well, well, if, by the way, this is the reason why so many people have a problem with pornography yeah and this is also a reason why a lot of women have issues with dating apps the dating apps they start to believe that these guys they're rejecting are yeah. actually better than and men start watching pornography and they start believing they would have access to these women they, they, they can't Porn separate has a lot of issues for the brain yeah. for humans too also because of like the dopamine it releases and yes. like dopamine is meant to be released when effort is exerted and so when we separate effort from dopamine, we get like pre pleasure for free, then it kind of zaps our uh, enthusiasm about doing anything else difficult in life. Yeah. So that's like one of the many problems with porn, but it also steals your creativity because yeah. I equate dopamine with creativity, curiosity. Um, you know, there's a, that's a very long conversation, but yeah, it's our brain doesn't know that that's like not really happening in front of us. So it thinks you're like sitting in the corner watching two people have sex, which is not a very empowering right. position to be in. And there's no so effort. It's, it's, it's damaging in a lot of ways. Um, you know, if we get back to like the person who's thinking about something that happened to them 20 years ago, yeah. to use an example most people can relate to, your body doesn't know that that's not happening right now. Oh, uh, yeah. Your body thinks that all of that trauma is occurring and you're experiencing all of the physical sensations in your body, the fight or flight, all of it, as if it's happening right now, many times worse than the original experience because over time we, we, we write stories. Like memory requires like changing memories. So like each time we remember something, it's not exact and sometimes it gets worse, especially if we play the victim in our life, you know? So yeah, our, our brain doesn't, doesn't know that those things aren't happening. And so if we can spend all, invest all of that time thinking about, the past and feeling it as if it's occurring now in our body, then what if we took a little bit of that energy and we spent it thinking about the future? Like, what if we lived in that for a moment and allowed like a thought about what a future might look like and, and our body doesn't know the difference, right? So yeah. show it what that feels like, show it what it lives like, it feels like to, you know, if your dream is to have a podcast, to be sitting in that room and having a conversation with someone you find really interesting, um, that's hypnosis. It's all Got connected. It. Yes, yeah. that makes sense. Um, so, uh, we were talking about this, you we were talk, talking about you're a fan of the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah. Sometimes they run the same play out of different formations, yeah. right? They'll, it'll be the same quarterback draw play to, uh, Lamar Jackson, but it's out of different formations, three wide versus whatever. A lot of the mechanisms that I see, and I, I don't, obviously not going to ask you to explain them, but the mechanisms I see, whereas you're guessing what he's going to say before mm -hmm. he says it. Mm -hmm. Is it, the, is it similar mechanisms for all these different tricks? Meaning like you can just keep doing this, but with a different formation. Meaning one time you're, kind of. you're reading a magazine. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. You know, in the sense that like a thought is a thought. Yeah. So like I can ask you to think of a word or to think from a dictionary or to think of like the name of a friend from 20 years ago. Those yeah. are both just words, right? So in many ways, it's the same thing. But also like my performance is a bit like jazz in the sense that like, I don't know necessarily what direction it's going to go. And so mm. I can have a goal and you see the final result of let's say those branches on the tree, but it's not one path that it necessarily is going to take. I might have like this in mind, but I know that X, Y, Z can also happen. And if that happens, that's okay too. And I pivot. Um, so like, you don't know where it's going as an audience, I don't tell you up front. And that allows me the flexibility to like, one, if I want to get an idea in your head, if I want to make you pick something or force you to say something without you feeling like I forced it. Yeah. Um, but that fails. And I recognize that that fails. I might have to shift gears. I might have to shift gears to now that was a free choice. And now I need to figure out what you decided. Oh, and so I got switched it. from okay. getting an idea in your head to now I got to get an idea out of your head. And we have techniques for doing that as well as magicians and mentalists. So it's a bit like jazz in the sense that like I have an outcome in mind, but how I get there might not be this 
this straight line. It might be like this, and I still end up here, but it doesn't always take that same path. It might go this way and land here, or it might have a different outcome altogether, and you don't know where it's going. But the what I mean is I, the mechanisms for influence are mm -hmm. still there, and you can use them in different uh, yeah. So, so what I'm saying is you have a mechanism for influence, which pick the, the, the three of diamonds and yeah. a different mechanism for influences. Hey, can you write down the name of someone uh, that you remember? Yeah, from it's, a like long a time ago? it's like a collected body of knowledge that you're drawing from. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there is innovation. There is genuine innovation. And I do think you can take things further than people thought possible. I think hypnosis is the field where like the most innovation is happening yeah. right now. As far as I, I do street hypnosis, which is slightly different in style than like stage hypnosis or hypnotherapy in that like you, the person I'm approaching has no idea that I'm a hypnotist or that you're about to be hypnotized. So in a lot of ways, it's the most raw and organic because like that person left their house that day, not expecting to be like hypnotized on the streets in Venice and then be like picking up a van on the side of the road, yeah. which is a video we did recently. Um, that person was just like going for a walk on the beach and then all of a sudden they're like the hero of their own journey or they're a star of this movie they don't even know is taking place, you know, where a crowd of people is cheering them on as they're attempting this feat of superhuman strength. So, um, yeah, I think like that's really interesting to me. And so one of the things I've been exploring with some of my friends who are street hypnotists lately is we go out and we challenge each other. So like, what if you didn't say the word sleep? Like, do you have to say sleep to make hypnosis happen? Hypno hypnotists have for hundreds of years. They reference it in this book in 1899. Mm. But does that mean you have to, or have we always just done it that way because it works? And so we'll try to go out and never use the word sleep. We'll try to go out and do hypnosis with no words at all. Just do nonverbal hypnosis, which you can do as well. You can catch the gaze of a stranger on the other side of the street and you can put them to sleep. They don't even have to know who you are or what you're doing. You can just start mirroring them. They'll start mirroring you and you can put them under with no words um, as well. It's difficult, but it can be done. Is, so is we'll that, present challenges like that for each other and then see like, okay, can we actually pull this off? Uh, is the, there seems to be some object in front of the person or your hand comes up to their it face. It could be, you could use a focal point because yeah. we're trying to bring them into the present moment. And so that's what, I, that's what my question was. Is that like a pattern a, interrupt a, that brings them into the present moment? There's a concept moment? in hypnosis. I don't hear a lot of people talk about, but one of my mentors, Mr. P shout out, Mr. P, uh, mentioned, which is called an overload. And an overload is where you do everything you can to overload their senses so that you are suddenly the most interesting thing in their world. And so if you're on Fremont street, for example, it's really challenging environment. There's so much to see. There's so much to hear, right? In some ways that's helpful because it kind of becomes white noise in the background at a certain level. But if somebody is distracted by either the environment or just the thoughts in their own head, because some people can be like in a room like this and be super distracted. Yeah. They don't need distractions. They distract themselves all day long, right? Um, you, can, you can bring that person in the moment with an overload. And an overload might be a lot of instructions um, that they're following and a quick cadence to my speech and different things I'm telling them to focus on. So it might be stand over here. You know what? Actually, I changed my mind. Switch places with me. No, but the camera's here and then it's going to oh, look. the overload. So, Got yeah, it. So, so actually, you know, you stand here because the camera guy's there. That'll be perfect. And look at my hand. And they're going, what? Da, 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 da. It's like you have to keep up, right? And so now their brain goes from like being the one deciding what they're thinking about to like they're having to catch up. So you're like pacing and leading them and they're having to catch up to your instructions until they get to a point where they're just following everything you say. And then you interrupt a pattern that they sort of expect to end the way it always ends, like a handshake. And then you throw in your direct instruction with confidence, rapport and trust already established. And then before you know it, their eyes are closed and you're creating a whole new reality for them. There seem to be like three different things that I saw, three different categories. Okay. Whereas one of them is hypnosis. That's mm -hmm. not a trick. You're actually hypnotizing mm -hmm. them. There's like, forget what your name is. Yeah. That doesn't seem like a trick. That's just you're using hypnosis. A second one where there's some level of suggestion to where, hey, is there someone you were thinking about previously or pick this card? Mm -hmm. And then a third one, which is just straight magic trick, like pulling yeah. the Tic Tac out of your eye. That's yeah. not hypnosis. Or a, you might call that a stunt, like a body stunt, because I'm really yeah. interested in old like sideshow stunts, like yeah. sword swallowing and fire breathing and you know the human pick, pin cushion and the blockhead. So yeah. uh, I had a mentor or have a mentor. His name's Harley Newman, who is a master in all those old sideshow techniques. And so I bring that a little bit of that into my performance because I think the body is is equally magnificent and interesting as the mind. You know what I mean? Um, so that kind of borders the line between sideshow stunt. It's a bit of history. It feels like a magic trick, but it is really happening. Um, and then I do have a background as a magician as well. And I am a hypnotist and I do have a really solid foundation in human psychology. And, and that is what why I call myself a mind hacker, because my performance is a marriage of all those things. Yes. And so you are correct in recognizing that those different things and 
are happening in one of my performances. And I'm honest about the skills that I have and what my background is, but it's up to you as the viewer to decide at any given moment what you are seeing. So I never tell my audience that that's suggestion. That's me reading them. That's hypnosis. I just say, these are all the things that I do. And I think that's part of the fun in watching a performance is going, well, what exactly is this? What am I seeing? Is it possible to know what someone's thinking? Is it possible to shape someone's thoughts? Is it, is it possible to make what feels like a free choice and it not have been a free choice at all? Am I just a puppet? You know, I think it, I think questions are more interesting than answers, right? It starts a conversation about the nature of the reality the nature of our mind, how we can be influenced. And, um, it's one of the goals with my performance is just to get people asking questions about the mind and what are we capable of? And, you know, at a higher level, what are the stories we tell ourselves and how are we trapped by those stories and how are those stories limiting us? Because ultimately I believe the mind is magic. Mm. It is the greatest tool we have to change our life. I've heard the, the, the description, the human brain is the most complex system created in the entire universe. And that's not hyperbole. Like we, even if you consider like nuclear fusion inside mm. of a star, there's so like what goes on in the human brain Aren't because we magnificent because it's the more most advanced brain that's on this planet. Mm -hmm. And we can't, we cannot use computers at this point yet to make a, a brain that can, that can do the same things that our brain is. This is the most complicated thing mm. that natural selection has created. And so that actually kind of leads me to my next point, which is the concept of free choice and free will. Mm -hmm. And um, the, I don't know if you've seen the experiments where they do fMRI scans on people when they ask them a question to come up with their own preferences for, for whatever. And moments before, just very, like less than a second before, they actually come up with a thought. They talk about when they, they like press a button when they come up with a thought. Okay. Moments before the thought, there's actually uh, neurons and axions, there's firing, neurochemical firing that goes on in the brain, which would indicate that there's something going on before you have this thought, which means the thought isn't even yours, Yeah. right? And then we get into this book behind where do, me. Where do ideas come from? Right, I, but the thing is, regardless of where they come from, yeah. we think they came. We can't. We think they came at this moment. Okay, but they came before. Oh, because of a it goes back to what you said before. Because of a suggestion, mm. a piece of stimulus, or some genetic factor that caused us to be that way. Right, we're not as random as we think we are. Or, or, that or, or how about not random at all? And so the next part where I, uh, about this is this concept of evolutionary psychology, the book behind me, and the, the idea that all of our proclivities come th from natural selection. At some point, there's 60,000 humans on the planet and everything we had to do or believe or want, our pattern recognition, necessity for food, actual access to scarce resources, access to uh, you know sexual selection, all of those things had to aid in our survival at some point because there's 8 billion humans on the planet and there's only 400,000 elephants left. We won, we figured mm. out something. And so these concepts, when you, when you really dilute them down, they get to a point where is there there anything that is free will and then you actually support the the my point even more so because I don't believe in free will I believe in free will to a certain extent like I believe we can eat between chocolate and vanilla ice cream but not chocolate and poop like there's this very small <laughs> sliver of things right some people would disagree right but uh, yes there are a few people but the thing is the thing is like I can't choose to like the smell of sulfur or if there was yeah, a snake yeah, yeah. that was here most and it's not just or, humans. Or I can't choose to keep my hand over a flame a fi as it or fire. Yeah. But the thing is, like when I look at if I look at my cat, my cat also doesn't want fire. My cat also has a fear of mm -hmm. heights. My cat also, if there was a loud noise, like it's like this is this is mammalian evolution yeah. over 178 million years. And so you ask yourself the question, like how much of this is really me at all, and how much of this is okay the, the concept of like a, a a brain floating in a jar just yeah. receiving different levels of stimulus. But the concept of free will, it's like I have free will up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. I can't free will myself to like the smell of sulfur. I can't free, do you understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I do. Yeah. And so, so that's the point It's like, even if the, if it's a function of genetics or suggestion, like you're saying, like a function of stimulus, I'm just curious, like, what do you think of the implications of this? It's wild. I, okay. So if we accept that we come into this world with information, yeah, I think we have to accept that as of a baseline course. fire hot, that's, you know, that's what Heights, bad, that's, scary. That's what evolution Water, psychology I can't is. breathe. Yeah. Right. So if we accept that we come into this world with information, which I agree we do, then the question is, where does that end? And that is really hard to answer, right? Because if we come in with any information at all, then how much information can we come into this world with? That brings up conversations about generational trauma. Like, do we inherit the like, unresolved trauma of our past family members, the things that they were never able to let go of. I think people carry the burdens of the past just as they carry the, carry the gifts and information of the past. 
Um, you can have an emotion that has no story attached to it, mm. you know, but you feel a certain way and you can also release that and know that it's free and it's out of your body and you're free of it, but you don't even know what it was or how it got there. And it seems to have a location within the body as well. Like if you ask someone to like locate that memory of that feeling in their body, they can be very specific about where it is. And when it's gone, they can be specific about that, not feeling it in that area anymore. So, um, I, I don't know, I don't have all the answers to that, but I do think that we are more programmed than we'd like to believe that yes. we are. And I do think that we are constantly being bombarded with new suggestions. And if you just remove, if you just remove intent, like just remove whether you think this is like a nefarious intent or they have our best interest in mind, they being whoever's trying to influence us, the government, the media, advertisers, if you just remove intent, you have to acknowledge that everyone has a message to communicate and they want to communicate it effectively and they do want to change your behavior. So they are attempting to influence you because sometimes people think that like, this is like a, it's a dirty word influence, right? Like, Oh, we uh, no, no one's trying to manipulate or control us. But if you remove intent and you, and you assume even give the benefit of the doubt and say that everyone has our best interests in mind, well, even then they would still have to get their point across vote for red team or blue team, yeah. you know, right? That kind of idea. So influence is always being used, even if you remove intent. Now, if you layer a negative intent on top of it, then you really start to wonder about the messages you're hearing and the stories yeah. you're being told and things like that as so, well. So, so. so even if there was no intent behind the influence, you're still going to receive influence. Like yeah, in a because vacuum, we're, because we're the, attempting we're, to communicate. Yeah. I mean, it, it, a better way to think about influence, I would just say is effective communication. Yeah, it, You're not the used car salesman trying to pe teach people. I think that's one of the great things Jeremy's done with sales is like, it's about being of service. I think the best salespeople are being of service, right? I'm not trying to convince you to buy something you don't need. Why would I want to do that? And how would I stay in business if that was my business model, right? Yeah. For me personally, selling my services as a performer on a conference stage or a convention. So like, if you want to think about that, like the best way to be influential before you go into a sales call is just to have a positive intent. And your intent should be so positive that before you pick up the phone to answer that call or to call that person back, that you, you set the intention that no matter what, I'm going to help this person. Even if that means recommending my biggest competitor would be what's in their best interest, that's what I'll do because mm. I am so of service. Now, I don't believe in competition, so that's a whole other conversation. But if you can get in that mentality of like, like if what's best for them is to recommend my biggest competitor, then that's what I'll do, they're gonna feel that coming through in the conversation, right? So now it's not like using influence for, uh, you know, to get them to do something they don't want to do. It's, it's just being more effective with your words. The same way that body language isn't like detecting lies or like calling, catching someone out. Like if I could teach you to be a better listener, would that make you uh, a better friend to your friends? I think so. Yeah. yeah. If I could teach you to be a better listener, would that make you a better leader for your team? Yeah. If I could teach you to be a better listener, would that make you better in your romantic relationships? Yeah. Right. So think of body language as another form of listening. I need to get this guy an affiliate code. That's exactly <laughs> what I teach. So look at the, oh. the books that are behind you. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. So think of body language as like another form of listening. And so if someone wanted to go down that rabbit hole and, you know, up their skill set and like a foundational understanding of body language that's based on like real world information and not academics, I would say to check out the book, What Everybody is Saying by nice. Joe Navarro. OK, really sure. good. Um, you know, he was an interrogator and he would use this in real life to decide, like, what is this person telling me? Where are they under stress? You know, where should I ask deeper questions? And he has these beautiful, you know, photographs and charts of like different body postures and things like this. And it's not academic. This is someone who used this in a really high stakes environment. Yes. Um, and you can apply it to the business world. And then on the influence side, um, think of that as just being more effective with your words. And like, would it be helpful to like communicate your actual intent to the people in your life that you care about to be more effective with your words for them to finally hear you yeah. when you say, I'm here to support you. I love you. You're safe. You know, I believe in you, whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just a reframe of something that I think people look at sales um, and influence and, and reading people as like nefarious and used car salesmen. Yeah. But really, it's just about being more of service. And that comes back to the intent piece. Yeah. So, so with the intent piece, because this is something mm -hmm. I talk about with Jeremy and also something I talk about with other coaches. So like sales, dating, mm -hmm. all this diff different kind of stuff is people I trust, I will give intent to. People who I don't know yet, I'm not going to come out there and like hard sell because I'm showing too much intent. And like you said, maybe I 
uh, re- recommend my like I've had guys come on my calls before and so yeah, got, this isn't for you they said serious problems of like I don't really think you want to put in the effort for this and I really would recommend a therapist instead of coming to see mm. me because there's certain things I can't prescribe you know gabapentin for you I can't prescribe Zola for you like there's certain things you might need that I can't do for you and so that's that's the thing that'll happen but Jeremy he talks about uh, the concept of like I'm almost confused I'm like is this the thing that you still want to keep doing like you, <laughs> and then that feeling comes back into them it's like is this like your wife left you is this you you want to keep feeling that feeling uh, that's fine if you do i'm just trying to understand and a lot of times it's confusion and the this thing person that hurt you is no longer alive yeah you yeah know? that's another big one they're yeah. no longer alive and let you're allowing them to continue to have power over you yeah. and they're still causing you pain and they're gone you know is it maybe time to let go yeah um the other yeah. the other one is the concept though with women a lot of times showing intent up front is not working for you like i try to tell guys a lot of times like full intent uh the intent should be for you and her to have a great time together. Yeah. But a lot of times what I found is that when guys are showing too much intent in, uh, up front without the girl would doing it, anything to earn would it. Would that be because their intent is goal oriented, outcome of oriented yes, versus of course. an internal state? So like, I, I think they would be misconstruing the word intent in that situation. Let's say they were looking for a wife and wanted to start a family and they were tired of shallow, empty relationships. Their intent might be to find their wife. That 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 could scare a woman away because it's go. too much too soon. That's exactly But right. if instead their intent was just like, I'm going to be present and I'm going to uh, show this person who I am and I'm not going to be scared and I'm going to be open, like that intent can't fail you. Yes. Right? And so one is, is like um, outcome driven, which isn't helpful. And the other is an internal state. Those are two different ways to think about intent. An, an internal so if your intent st- yeah. is to make a sale, that's not the kind of intent we're talking about. If your intent is to serve this person no matter what, even if my product isn't right and I'm going to recommend a competitor, that's a that's not outcome oriented. Well, it is. The outcome is to serve that person, but it's a more holistic intent rather than something that's self-serving or outcome oriented. So presence without uh, with outcome independence. Is what you're saying because mm-hmm. that that makes sense mm-hmm. a lot of sense to me for me what i what i recommend for guys to go do is like do something you would have loved to do anyway like for instance <laughs> i love the butter cake at masters like i gotta stop eating it i'm 46 but i love the butter cake at masters if i went on a I date f- with I a girl try it. it's incredible is it okay uh, when i was single if i went on a date with a girl to the butter cake at masters and she got up like dude fuck you you suck and got up and left i'd be like I got the butter cake. Like, I really don't. It's so (laughs) awesome. I don't care. Going to like play playground or area 15 or like going up and down Fremont, doing something with her that I would have done anyway. And then just being like, what my intent for tonight is for us to have a great time together. And that's, yeah, you can't really fail in that case, right? Exactly. Yeah. As opposed to what I put all the pressure on, this has to be the one for the rest of my life. And I have to figure that out right now in this but, moment. Or, or, or the issue of like giving a massive amount of validation to someone who didn't do anything to earn it. You're showing like what you said before about influence. Uh, one of the things you talk about, like, I think when you're sitting there talking to Kai Sanat, they also all of a sudden see you as higher status. That's why they're all listening. And if you're showing a massive amount of intent when they did nothing to earn it, not in that case, but like say if you're on a date, it's like, oh my God, you're so beautiful. Like, like move in with me. It, yeah, it, it, it would be like if you're trying too hard to impress them in the context of Kai Snap versus I just want to share something interesting with exactly. you. Exactly. Like I'm here to just show you something cool. Your viewers have a good time, you know, not yeah. here to get famous or promote my own brand or to, you know, beat you. Yeah. Yeah. That w- those would be very different intents and anyone would feel that. Yeah. And I think that's what worked for you. Like that's what that's what crushed it for you because these guys, like you allowed them. You didn't try to force it on them. You just allowed there to be this void, this space, and then they just came into it. They're like, yeah. I need to know more. I want to know more. And you saw a bunch of them grabbing you. Like they felt very <laughs> comfortable grabbing you. You're like, yeah. you're a demon. That was a pattern demon. interrupt for me. I was like thrown against the wall by Gierbo, and I was like, yeah. I don't know what's about to happen next. Yeah. And I had to like diffuse him in that moment. Almost it was like hypnotic. I was like, are you good? And then it just like snapped him out of it. I remember you know? that, yeah. Like, yeah, it is one yeah. of the things. That, that was the other thing I noticed is like everyone was very comfortable touching everyone <laughs> in that scenario, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. Everybody's very. That is, that is a piece of hypnosis is getting people used to you touching them because yeah. you do have to be physical at times, yeah. make adjustments and things like that. Um, but that also builds rapport and trust. So I might start at the beginning when I'm hypnotized someone just by saying, is it okay if I touch you? And then yeah. I'll adjust their hands or their elbow or something like that, which like allows you to be inside of that bubble or that circle. And if you're not a very like touchy kind of, hands-on person it might be hard to learn hypnosis because you do have to get within someone's personal space for safety reasons because if i say the word sleep and you drop like a bag of bricks it's like my obligation to keep you safe that's like my number one priority when i'm doing this with someone right so i have to be both physically strong enough and close enough to you and train in the proper way to like handle a body that's dead weight you know how to lay someone down safely things like that um so yeah you do have to get within someone's comfort zone and that goes back to the rapport and trust and a little bit of personality so um I have a lot of one-on-one 
clients. Uh -huh. I have a, about 1,500 clients total right now. Uh, a lot of times we'll do one-on-one -on -one calls. I'll turn the recording off, and we go to very dark places. Mm. And I've gotten better at it, but it was a, a situation, and a lot of my sales guys say the same thing. We turn the recording off, and it, a lot of times taking their own life comes up, stuff like that. And you take that with you afterwards, and you deal with that over and over again. I can think so probably social you're workers. You're saying you as the coach or facilitator, coach. you can carry that energy with you yeah I mean you, you but I it, heard that it, like it can it can wear like you're mm -hmm. taking like a mass you're having a great day and a guy comes mm -hmm. on there well that's and, empathy you put yourself in yes. a situation of imagining that trauma for that child or whatever the situation yeah. is um I think that is a choice so I talk to people who are healers and yeah things like that all the time and coaches and I've never encountered that because it's simply a choice like I don't allow no one has the ability to change my state got it no one gets to decide how I feel I made that decision in my mid 20s was that like I'm the only one that gets to decide how I feel nobody else have has you that ever right. read so a lot of not giving a fuck like Mark Manson no a lot of what you're describing is is from that book well and, truth is truth so it comes yeah. up in the form of like uh stoicism or Taoism or the bible or Mark Manson's what is it so yeah, art of not giving a fuck yeah it, it's wisdom is wisdom and sometimes you just need to hear it in a different package for it to get through to you you know, and so you might tell someone the same thing over and over again, but then they read it in this book and finally they hear it for the first time. Could be that you're not the right messenger, but that's another yeah. conversation. Um, but no, I think it's a it's a choice. And so I you you can do it two ways. You can you can just simply not allow it to enter you, or you can make a decision that anything that enters and passes through you is converted to love. Okay. So you can you can just make a decision. You can place yourself in a state that any, anything that passes, and maybe that's your gift, yeah. is you're able to absorb that and turn it into love and transmute it. But um, that's a little bit abstract, you know, for some people to wrap their head around. And I think it is as simple as realizing it is a choice because I have people say to me all the time during um, the shutdown, I was doing a lot of one on ones over Zoom because I was like, how can I use what I do to help people, you know, where everybody's trapped at home. So there's a little bit of a mental health crisis there as, as well, right? Being isolated is really hard for anybody. It's not what we're supposed to do as human beings. Um, and but, people kept saying to me, like, how does it not affect you? Like, and I was like, it just doesn't, you know, and yeah. I, I had to kind of reflect on that to remember that I made that choice, you know, over, you know, in my twenties to just simply not allow other people to have the ability to change my state. doesn't yeah. mean I don't get angry and frustrated in life. I'm a human being. Yeah. Right. But it's created enough space to realize that like, it's just, yeah, it's being able to zoom out a little bit and recognizing that you are not your thoughts you know, yeah. and your emotions are just reactions and you can just create a little bit of space and center yourself and have practices to do that as well. An internal locus of control. Mm -hmm. That's what it seems like. like yeah. Emotional that. regulation. Yeah. I think piece of it. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're like, I think right now it's, I don't know how to put this. People are being taught to like really identify heavily with their emotions more than any time in history. It's like okay to express your feelings and this is and, great hearing you say and, this. And yes. I get the direction. I, I think that that is directionally correct. But I think it's a disservice in the sense that like it's 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 as if like those emotional states were fact based and true and permanent and meant to be and the only option. It doesn't give any control. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't imply that first of all what you're thinking about and the stressing you out might not even be true. Yes. So like the emotions that are resulting as a result are also not true. So like if two possibilities exist at the same time, why don't we choose the one that makes us feel better rather than the one that makes us feel worse? If we don't know whether X or Y happened, why do we choose the one that makes us feel worse? You know, if it's equally possible, let's choose to believe the thing that, that makes us feel better. But also it's just that over identification with feelings. Yeah. It's, it's like coddling of a, of a generation. And it's like that tough love thing of like, I remember when I was growing up and I'm not that old, like it was like, walk it off. That yeah. was the advice. That was the advice when yeah. faced with physical pain or emotion was walk it off. And again, I think maybe we went too far then with like dismissing emotion. I think there's something somewhere in the middle, but I think it's just like recognizing that like there's no objective reality, number one. And then number two, that like we actually get to decide how we feel, yeah. right?
Well, the the other thing is the concept of the negative emotion outlook, what you said, outweighing reality. Mm. Like your boyfriend tells you he loves you every day, but your insecurity causes you to, to, to believe that he doesn't. You now the negative emotions have caused you to like not now you can't even see objective reality. You're the sea of emotions that you're in are heavier than the right. physical mass of the objects around you. Yeah. And I think that's where it gets to be problematic. The second thing, as you said before, you talked about stoicism, Marcus Aurelius, this concept. My favorite one, um, modern stoic would be Jocko Willick. He talks about Hey man, you just made an extra million dollars. Good. Hey man, your life just your wife just left you. Good. Hey man, the business has taken off. Uh, you you won a bunch of awards. Good. Hey man, sorry, you just you have terminal cancer. Good. No matter what, he cut he faces it the exact same way, because I think the issue is a lot of times what happens is there's this belief like what you said before of individuals thinking that because men are not expressing wild and vastly varied emotions all the time, that they're going to somehow crack and break. And it's like, no, if men did that, the society is what would crack and break. It is actually men able to control their emotions that are better leaders, better fathers, better executives. And the men who don't are the ones out there starting fights, acting crazy, cheating, lying, and do doing stuff like that. It is being in control of your emotions that allows you to be stoic and allows you to do those kind of things. And I have this conversation with my girlfriend all the time. She's like, it's like, you don't feel anything. I was like, no, I feel exactly what you feel. I just made a choice before this that those feelings do not outweigh objective reality. They don't outweigh the fact that I have to, I have employees, I have to be at work at this time, I have to go to the gym. Those things don't, aren't outweighed because of the emotions that I feel in the yeah, present Yeah, you still moment. might feel shitty inside, yes. but you do it anyways. You do yeah. what you have to do anyways. But there's also this understanding, I think that's really helpful in that like everything in life is always happening like for you, not to you. Mm. I think that's really important to recognize. And it's like the worst thing ever to say to someone when they've just lost a parent or a sibling or, or you know, a relationship just ended to say, oh no, this is what's best for you. Look for the silver lining. You'll see. Yeah. It's, it's the worst possible advice to give someone yeah. at the exact moment that they are experiencing devastation. But at the same time, if we look back at our own lives of all the things that have ever happened to us, I'm 40 years old and 40 years of my life, that has always been true. I, I can say for, for a fact that everything that's ever happened to me in my life has, has shaped me in some positive way. It's yeah. always happened for me and not to me. I'm not the victim of this story, right? And so if that has always been true, then it must always continue to be true which in the moment that something traumatic happens in my life, it creates just enough space, just enough space for me to recognize that like, although I might not see it yet, this has always been true, therefore it must be true now. Like life is always happening for me and not to me. And it just creates just a little bit of space between you and the events for you to recognize that while you may not understand it at this moment, like you will see, you will see. And it's also a choice to take the lessons from a situation and to not view yourself as a victim. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the, not having a victim mentality. The frame of, of maintaining that is just so important. Like, the things still happen. Um, uh, drunk driver ran over my father when I was in uh, 2006. And then afterwards, mm. I, I saw her on the stand, you know, mm. at the criminal trial. And I wow. told her on the stand, I forgive you, you know, for what happened, you know, whatever. It's incredible that you were able to do that. That's beautiful. Wow. It, but I, I told her that. And uh, <clears> she's saying, and I told her, I was like, hey, I hope all these things that you had that happened to you. In, in your life, I hope you get them settled. But I did say, you're probably gonna have to do that from prison. And I understand that. And I hope these things work out for you. And I said, hey, listen, I forgive you, whatever. Uh, and it was hard. I was in my uniform. Mm. I was a still in, I was a lieutenant in the Air Force. And I remember doing that. And it's just one of these things where I, re I read this, what you resist persists. And I never, when my dad died, resisted the fact that he died. I always accepted the fact that he died, but then chose how to act um, additionally, if that makes any sense. It's also right? how long do you remain in that state? Yes. I think that there's nothing wrong with being sad when a relative dies. Exactly there's my point. There's nothing wrong. And, and like, I think like the conversation around masculinity sometimes is perceived as like creating robots. Right. You know? And you're not, you didn't just describe to me a person that's a robot. Yeah. You didn't describe to me a person that has no emotions. You described to me a person that had enough empathy that they could see themselves in the person up on the stand that they were able to forgive them. That is not a person that is not in touch with their emotions. That is not a person who is insensitive or lacks empathy or is a robot. That's incredibly difficult and brave and courageous and beautiful and loving, you know, all at the same time. So I think it's just about like not allowing those states to persist and there's nothing wrong with grieving and there's nothing wrong with being sad and there's nothing wrong with being angry and there's nothing wrong with being depressed. We're not talking about depression, which is a prolonged state, yeah. but in a moment for a day, for a moment, I mean, we all go on waves of how we feel. 
but also it's like what you do in those circumstances and recognizing what you need to do and who you need to serve and where you need to step up and still meeting your your obligations but of course you know you can be both strong and emotional at the same time there's no reason you can't be both yeah i was i was bringing up the story because of what you just said with this, this idea of like hey you just lost someone is like hey look for the silver lining yeah. and my, my whole thing is and I, I've, I've said this to my friends like you know feel what you feel mm. fully go into the thing that you're feeling but also recognize that your decision to go break things, kick people, cuss at people, or leave really nasty comments on YouTube and TikTok, those decisions, you don't have to do those things because you feel the way that you feel. When you resist the way you feel, you clinch up, you get really tight, a lot of times it'll stay longer. You'll stay in that state for a longer period of time. Yeah, and if you time. don't allow yourself to feel it, it won't pass through you. It'll stay in your body, and that becomes something that you either have to let go of down the road or that will affect the way you live forever. So yeah, yeah we think there's this like conversation around um, trauma and bad things that happened in our past. And you hear people all the time use the word processing. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I'm processing that, you know? And it implies that in order for us to overcome the bad things that happened in our life, we must exert some level of effort. I'm figuring it out. I'm mulling it over. I'm trying to make sense of it. I'm taking the lessons. I'm, mm. And you're putting this kind of energy, this... I've just got to, I've got to, to shape it so yeah, that I can digest that's, it. That's the energy you're putting into the the thing in this past, and you're trying to, to to process it. But that's actually not how we get past anything in life, and that's not how we become free of behaviors that don't serve us and thoughts that don't serve us and stories that we tell ourselves. The way that we become free of the past is by simply releasing it, mm. letting it go, which is the simplest thing and the hardest thing to do at the same time. It's very simple, not necessarily easy. Right. But that and we don't even have to make sense of it or have to understand it. We don't have to reach that level of clarity around these events. We can simply choose to let them go. Mm. And there's many ways you can do that. You can do it through journaling and meditation and you can do it through therapy. You can do it through hypnosis. You can just say enough's enough and decide one day to just be free of it all and have a whole new way of being. Um, but it's not through efforting that we are free of the past. It's simply letting it go. Uh, the, anytime I meet someone who's 40 in shape, successful, I always ask to ask the question about biohacking. And if, huh. if you're involved in any of that cold plunge, yeah. intermittent fasting, keto diet, uh, I have you know. experimented with and explored all of those things. I don't have a morning routine or lifestyle that is worthy of a YouTube video or, uh, in, in any way uh, impressive. It's just things that I've made part of my life. Like fitness has been part of my life since I was like a little kid. My brother and I had weights in the gym in our basement and we worked out. So I think it's like just lifestyle. I think I used to be really obsessed with supplements and routines and this and that. And I, and I have started to realize that it's lifestyle over everything. Yeah. So it's like the things that are sustainable, the things that you're able to maintain. And it's like doing something long enough that it actually brings you joy, that it's not a chore. And so like when people ask about fitness or exercising, it's like you have to do it long enough that you actually miss it when you don't. Yes. Like you have to overcome that, which takes a Momentum, while. Yeah. Yeah. To where you actually enjoy it and to where actually you feel worse when you don't go. So it's just really simple for me. It's just eating whole foods, real food, you know, and exercising as often as I can. And I'm not perfect. I used to go to the gym five days a week. I go when I can, mm. you know, which is most days, but not every day. And I'm realizing now the things that like I ignored most of my life because they weren't fun or I wasn't good at them are the things that are catching up to me the most. And that'll be like mobility and flexibility. I always just focused on like bodybuilding and strength training. So I think it's just like more holistic approach to everything. And really it's like lifestyle. It's like where I focus my energy and my time. Um, the Whoop helped. That's like the one gizmo. Yeah. I stopped wearing it, but it, it gave me so much information that I didn't have about my own behavior and habits and things like that. So, no, I don't have a crazy nerdy like Huberman protocol that I run each morning. I don't wake up with an alarm. I just get up whenever I get up. Yeah, nothing complicated. Just get outside and sunlight and yeah. try to like limit my screen time and, you know, do things in a more natural way. Yeah. Get outside put my feet in the grass. You know, the funny thing for me is I, I came into this much like my belief about hypnotism before, uh, very skeptical. Anytime I, I was like, oh, this is another Tim Ferriss mushroom tea, <laughs> drink this shit, blah, whatever. Then I tried the cold plunge and like, uh, you know, I have knee and back problems mm -hmm. and I'll try the cold plunge and all my sciatica is gone. All this yeah. kind of stuff is like, okay, well, there it's might be something energy here. and your mood is wild. Yeah. 
a lack of inflammation, mood, energy. Yeah. You get out of it, you feel like you survived something. And then I got the I got the aura ring and the whoop, and then I was like, okay, let me check out my sleep. I was like, no, I'm not doing well here. Yeah, and it's funny. I was talking to Bulzarian about it and, uh, uh, two days ago, and he's like, yeah, man, my sleep sucks. Like, it, this yeah. is one of the biggest issues that I have is the sleep situation. So now, like, I'm it's almost a competition to see if we can sleep better. Yeah, right? yeah. That's it makes thing. you. I think it just like places awareness on it, and yeah. it's like where your focus goes. Like yeah. those things improve, and also it's just like objective data. Like I thought I was sleeping for eight hours. No, I was in bed for eight nice. hours, and to me that meant I got eight hours of sleep. That was the biggest take away from the whoop it's so silly yeah but it was like oh no i went to bed at 11 and i got up at seven i got eight hours of sleep nope look at the whoop six and a half hours of sleep no wonder i feel like shit woke up 12 i've been times. chronically undersleeping yeah. for 20 years you know and so now i realize i have to be in bed for nine hours to get eight hours of sleep i didn't sleep for nine hours i got eight hours of sleep even though i was in bed for nine hours so that was the biggest takeaway for me from the whoop was like oh i've just been undersleeping yeah and then the food one i mean for me like growing up in Texas, we just, I just say junk food all the time. I, that's yeah. what we would eat the dollar menu off Wendy's, yeah. and then not realizing the but habits. Food has changed too. Yeah. You could get away with that more twenty years ago than you can now because sure. the ingredients in junk food were different then than they are now. Um, so that's a now good point. food is a lot more toxic. Our world is a lot more toxic. Our toxic burden is higher um, because of our lifestyle, because of the amenities and all this wonderful technology we have that saves us so much time yeah um and yeah and what's considered junk food is now is almost poison so that's another conversation but yeah. i luckily i think the bottom line is you have to find what works for you so i tried intermittent fasting i felt like shit every day really i tried to get over the hump you know i tried keto you know that oh you just got to get far enough along now my brother who i'd assume has similar genetics to yeah. me he thrives on keto i don't i feel terrible so it's just like you have to find what works for you and you have to find what's sustainable. Yeah, I have breakfast at so, 5 p.m., man. Like nice. that's my first meal. I love meal. that for like, you. Like right now, like I'm you just know? like, no, but I'm totally. But everyone's body's different. So, so I think it's like not seeing a piece of advice on the internet and going, that works for everyone. That's it's just exactly like, right. try things. So I'm a biohacker in the sense that like I experiment constantly with inputs, but I, at the end of the day, look at what works for me. Yeah. I look at what works for me. I think I think the issue with the with the uh, intermittent fasting is like how do, you, how do your insulin spikes and, and droughts work for you. So for instance, yeah. I was talking to Mike Rashid about this. I don't know if you know, he's like a fitness influencer. And he was like, dude, I eat once a day because after I eat, I just lose so much energy. And I was like, me <laughs> too. When I was in the military, we would go eat and I would come back and I'd want to go yeah. to sleep. If it was you're so getting tired after meals, that could point to gut dysfunction. So yeah. that'd be like a whole other thing to explore to someone with for, someone. For sure. And, that, and that's another yeah. thing that I'm looking at too. So the things I did was I switched to a paleo diet. So nothing I have is processed. You're eating real food. Exactly. Yeah, e nothing e wrong with that. And then so that with the gut uh, situation. But the other thing is like I notice that no matter when I eat, there's this like uh -huh. little dip in energy that happens afterwards. And so I just would go as long as I could. And also I was consuming too many calories. And and, yeah. uh, and now I'm down to like two meals a but day. But you know what? It's also like okay for that to happen. It's also okay for us to not optimize every aspect of, of our life. It's also okay for us to recognize like... Like as a human being, I don't have a limitless gas tank. I don't have, and so we're striving for something, one, that's not realistic, right? And we put all of this pressure on ourselves to have this level of energy that's unsustainable. And so I think like for me, the biggest thing is just focusing on lifestyle yeah. and seeing improvements over time and recognizing that I'm a human being and we go through waves. And if I'm tired on a Saturday and all I want to do is rest and sleep, that's okay. Yeah. Where in the past, I would have beat myself up about that. And I'd have gone, oh, why am I so tired? You know why you're tired? Because you've been working like an animal for three months. That's why you're tired. You earned that. That's okay. But now is also an okay time to get some sleep. You don't have to optimize for productivity seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And I think that that's like, I, I we didn't talk about this, but I got like chronically ill with Lyme disease in around 2013, 2014. And it was because I was like a product of like hustle culture. Do you, know, like, do you know where you caught it? Uh, I grew up in Maryland, so at some point I got a tick bite. Okay. You know, they say it could be anywhere. It could be 10 oh. years, 20 years, it lies dormant, and then it wakes up when you're immune system is so depressed that it finally it's like advantageous. It lies dormant and then it can take over. And so I had done the Gary V like sleep when you're dead. I would say those things. I like made YouTube videos where I was yeah. like at all cost, whatever it takes sleep when you're dead. And that literally put me into a hole where I was like, so run down that this Lyme disease took over and my body said, okay, now we're going to rest. Like you didn't give us a chance to rest. So That's yeah, I think like, I think like recognizing what's sustainable is important and recognizing what works for you is important. The Lyme disease thing, uh, Crystal Hafner, I don't know if you know, she uh -huh. is, used to be Crystal Harris, uh, Hugh yeah. Hefner's yeah, widow. Yeah, she's a big like, advocate for Lyme disease. So, so she's a friend of mine, and, and I was she caught it when we, we were hosting a bikini competition at, at mm -hmm. uh, rehab. She didn't catch it there, but she postulized, she talked about it in her book, having a bunch of wild animals on the Playboy Mansion 
walking around might have been where she got this from. But you're saying it was a tick. It could yeah. it could happen yeah, at anywhere. really any point in your life. Yeah. But you and I could get bit by the same tick. Again, I'm not a doctor, but yeah. my, I had to really learn this and understand it to get better. You and I could be bit by the same tick and you could be healthy for the rest of your life. I could immediately show symptoms or I could 10 years later when I'm really run down that infection that lies dormant. They're like bur they have biofilms. They like burrow in your these little spirochetes. And it just joint pain yeah, and stuff like that. For yeah. me, it was more neuro symptoms, which was really strange because there's sort of two ways Lyme affects people. We're talking about chronic Lyme here, yeah. not just like a tick bite. Um, it can be physical where you're really sore and you have trouble walking or it could be neurological or it could be both. For me, I couldn't think. I had no energy. It really affected my energy and I literally couldn't think, couldn't have conversations. It was like I was living in a fog, which was wild because for a mentalist, like someone where my entire job is about my brain, I felt like I was losing my mind. And I had to stop performing completely. I went from doing like 150 shows a year to suddenly having to cancel. And I was trying to make do for a while. I had less of a schedule and would travel less. But then it got to a point where I would go do a show and I would come home. And for two weeks, I didn't even have the energy to get off a couch. And I was like, this has to change. And so I stopped performing completely and knew I had to put my health first because I put my work first for the first part of my life, the first half of my life. And it cost me my health. And so now I knew I had to focus on my health and changing, making permanent changes to my lifestyle so that I didn't get in this position again. And that was a really hard like place to go through because like I so heavily identified with what I did for work. There was like no separation between like what I did and who I was. My identity was that I was this performer, right? And when I suddenly couldn't do that anymore, I was so lost. I mean, I felt like, who am I? And if I can't, what does my life mean? And like, I'm never, I had to accept that maybe I was never going to be able to perform again because you read online that this is like a life sentence, that people never get better. So that's what I was going to ask you. I what did you do to most, get better? The most damning message in the world yes. is that this is for life. When people talk about Lyme disease, they go, you have to learn to live with it. This is what your life is always going to be like. And I am like a living testament to the fact that there is life on the the other side of Lyme disease and that not only can you get back to where you were, because my goal wasn't to get back to here, it was to actually be better than I've ever been in my whole life. I wasn't going to settle for like how I felt beforehand. It was like, no, I'm going to not only get past this, but I'm going to become this newer, better version of myself. How to get past it? The short answer is to change everything about my life. So this is going to be diet. This is going to be exercise. Diet, lifestyle, lifestyle, stress, stress food, sleep, stress, work, okay. food. Yeah, everything. Do you have any symptoms from it anymore? No. That's amazing. Yeah, because th this is exactly the conversation. This is the exact conversation I've had several times with other it's people that I know sentence. that have life, life, yeah. Lyme I, disease. I realize why people say that because one, a lot of the treatments that work aren't covered by health insurance, mm. which is a crime. The things that are really effective, and it's also really expensive. So I imagine being a... Are these medic m medications you're talking about? Yeah, it could be like ozone or hyperbaric oxygen or um, UVBI, like... It could be any anything. IVs, like none of this stuff is covered, you know? Wow, Chinese okay. herbs, whatever it is that works for you, like some kind of hero, heroic treatment. You should say you know? not covered because it's outside it's the outside normal. Outside of Got the it. antibiotic is like the only thing that they'll pay for. I thought it was a virus. Right? Is it a bi bacteria? Yeah, and they prescribe like an antibiotic to try, to try to get rid of it, and that doesn't work for a lot of people. And so like imagine you are a single mother with, you know, two kids and – you know, one of these like IV treatment sessions with ozone is like six hundred dollars. Oh, got it. And I'm doing it twice a week. H how? Do you literally how? mean ozone? Like O3? Yeah, they put ozone in a bag. They pull your blood out. They yeah. put it into an IV bag, your own blood. So they oxidate, oxygenate they shove, your blood instead yeah, of with O2. They, they put O3. Yeah, they put ozone into your blood. So they ozonate your blood. And then they pass that through um, an IV tube, which goes through a UV light, which sanitizes the blood. And then it goes back into your body. Um, yeah, you breathe out CO3? Is that what happens? <laughs> no, it goes into your blood. It doesn't go into your mouth. Right, but so, but, but so when you breathe, your when, blood. when I breathe in O2, it goes yeah. into my bloodstream, and the o, uh, then it co uh, combines with a carbon molecule or carbon atom, and then I get CO2. That's what I breathe I have out. no idea oh, okay. the science of it, but yeah. it worked. And That's it amazing. was really effective, um, but it's really expensive, and it was really time-consuming, and I had to stop working completely. How is that an option? How is that an option of course. for most people? Yeah. When it's that expensive, and it's really time-consuming, and you have to stop working, and you have a family to support, it's not even an option. So I understand why the conversation online becomes, you're going to have to learn to live with this. Because how else do you cope with the fact that like you don't have energy anymore, your body always hurts, and you can't think straight? You still have a family to support. It's not an option. So yeah, that's the that's the issue is that most of the things that work um, aren't aren't covered and they're expensive and time consuming. 
What, what when is it? you get that bad? Yeah. For some people, they get bit, they take an antibiotic, they're better, never have a symptom. Yeah. Yeah, it's that simple. But if it's a chronic case, it can be really hard. But not only that, the treatments, you have to change everything about your life. And I was really lucky that I already had a foundational, you know, like practice of exercise and of nutrition. And so I didn't have to change as much about my life, but I did have to rebalance like my priorities as far as like sleep and work and stress and things like that. Um, yeah. You went on a, a reality show, Love Games. Oh. I've, I've been on okay. three different reality shows. What would tell no me? No one's what was, ever brought that up. That's what? so crazy. I don't know where you found that or how you did. <laughs> I've looked. It's not on YouTube. That's crazy that you know that. Yeah. Uh, yes, I went on a very classy reality TV show called Love Games: Bad Girls Need Love Two, yeah. Season Three. Now it's the full title of the show, and it was like Bad Girls Club, but a dating show, and we're in a house all living together like Big Brother with these women and men that always are fighting. Like everybody's always fighting all the time, yeah. but in, they're like looking for love at the same time. Uh, what's your question about the show? That's so, what the show so, was. So <laughs> I, I didn't, first of all, I didn't understand what the show was. I, no, I, you don't I'll need to, and um, you <laughs> can edit this part out. Uh, yeah. No, you can leave it. Um, so so I went on a couple of reality shows, and I actually did it for the networking. I, the, the People have watched them before, <laughs> there but it was wasn't no, that big. No week. networking on this show, yeah, but, but I get it. The casting director uh, I became a good friend of mine. Yeah. He introduced me to a bunch of other people. I actually indirectly met, I met Justin Rossley, who introduced me to Usman Sheikh, who introduced me to Dan Bilzerian. Like, I met a bunch of people that I'm friends with now. I ended up hosting the Maxim party because of somebody I met from the show. I was just curious, like what you're like, I know a lot of people like trying to break into show business. Yeah, go do a reality I was show. like, I was, you know, I was a performer. Uh, I what were you had doing? aspirations. I, I, my whole life I've been performing. I've okay, never had it. another job. So I did my first show when I was 14. Um, so you like the Dave Chappelle of yeah, mentalism. Yeah, my like neighbor hired me to do a part, a show for their like daughter's sixth or seventh birthday or something. Um, shout out Franklin family. Thanks yeah. for my big break. Um, and then I, I'm 40, so 26 years. That's the only thing I've ever done is perform and be an entertainer. And for a long time, I wanted a TV show. And so like, I thought like, okay, well, let's go get some time in front of a camera, see if we like that world in that environment and to see what it's, and I also thought it would be fun. You know, I was in my twenties. It was like, this would probably be fun going to a reality dating show. And so when I was there, I, I didn't really play the show. Like everyone else i was trying to be like the puppet master like the hypnotist the magician character like pulling all the strings and i was so good at it i think that i actually was making the producer's job hard because the producer's job is to pull strings and set up situations i was pulling strings and setting up situations and starting fights i was like making people fight each other i'd have people say something about someone while they were standing right there and didn't know it i was like the puppet master i would like peek out from behind corners and like look around like I was like playing that character and just just exploring what it was like to tell stories uh, on camera and be a character. I certainly didn't go there looking for love. Um, but yeah, I, I loved that environment. I loved on a TV set. Everyone is there because they want to be because the hours suck. It's really long days. It is, it's yeah. a really hard job. They don't get a lot of sleep. They get fed terrible food, but yet they all are doing what they want to do, whether it's holding a camera or lighting or sound or whatever it is. And everyone had these really specialized jobs. I thought that was very cool. And they were all working towards a, a common vision. So that was my first exposure to what it was like to work in the world of video. And I realized that like no one's there by accident. And I thought it was real. I've never been in an environment working with other people or collaborating where everyone was really excited about what they were doing and what they were making, even if it was a cheesy dating reality show. Um, and I liked the idea of telling, telling stories on camera. So right after that show, I hosted a live stream on the internet. This was like through livestream.com or like Justin TV. It was like before you could live stream on anywhere. YouTube, yeah. And I did a, like a talking dead. It was like an after the show recap yeah. interview show where I would bring on the person who was voted off. Cause the show's like pre-filmed and came out later. So like the guy Shane gets voted off and then I would have Shane call in by a Skype and then I would broadcast that out to the fans of the show. And I did a fan talk show like this. But you have to wait till he gets kicked, kicked yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah. knew ahead of time what yeah. was going to happen because the show was pre-filmed. And so I was like hosting a talk show called Love Games After Hours that I created. We had a studio. We did live streaming. Well, live streaming was very hard back then. It was yeah. very difficult. The equipment you had to have and the internet connection. Um, and so that was like my early foray into live streaming, I think. And it was like all an exploration of... I mean, we can look back in our lives and always see how all the dots connect between like where we are now. Sure and can, even if yeah. we didn't know at the time why we did a thing, how it shaped what we do now. Um, and yeah, now I'm like live streaming on the street, doing magic for people. And that was just my entire life has been navigated by like what I find interesting or what I want to learn and just pulling different strings. And then that becomes a part of like who I am and what I do next. So, 
Yeah, oh. don't go looking for um, <laughs> the Magic Man on Love Games. You will regret it. Um, but it was a fun experience. So, so you, you ever really? Because you were talking before about gratitude. Right. Uh, and present moment awareness. Mm. One of my favorite books on that is actually called uh, Enlightenment Now by Stephen Pinker. And he okay. goes over how the world is just better now. People don't. Mm -hmm. It's a very controversial book. Now huh? or like now, like like now on the calendar, we're living in the greatest time to be alive. Or he means the world is better now, meaning now when you're present at no, any given the, moment. The first one. He's a he's yeah. a he's a professor of evolutionary okay, psychology gotcha. at Harvard. So uh, the but current the, technology and lifestyle and all the yeah, other like things you, we like have. If we wanted to fly to South Africa, it wouldn't cost us our entire it's year great saving. Time to be alive. And we wouldn't die of dysentery getting yeah. there. Like that's the difference. It's How like exciting. Like everything after like if you look at the everything after antibiotics, the the advent of broad spectrum antibiotics okay. in the thirties and forties, like the world, just the population, the planet just explodes mm. afterwards. Um and so so stuff like that that you find like the amount of information we can get some of it's not real, but the information we can get on the internet, like at the speed of light. Or do you, I mean, I mean you're maybe old enough to remember this, but like I remember hearing a song on the radio and having to like try to record it because yeah. I was never going to hear you it would again. You literally put a cassette in and record it and then make, and then you have to put that on another yeah. tape in order, like yeah. make a mixtape. Make a mixtape. Burning tape. CDs. I remember all that. Yeah, yeah. You, you you were doing all that kind of stuff and then there was Napster and you're stealing it. Now and we now, just have it all. It's awesome. Now it's like my phone has every song I've ever heard in the history of Earth on YouTube it's music wild. that I pay for $5 a month for. It's just crazy. And so you forget all that. Like the, the poorest people in the world now are still, they have antibiotics, which Henry VIII died of gout and he was the wealthiest man in the world mm. and he died of gout. Like when you consider that, like that's not something, we're better off than the richest man in the world was in the, in the 15th century. So when you come to those realizations, that's one of the reasons why like half the earth's population, like yeah. before the year 1850. Every like individual on the planet right now has more access to more information than like, the most important person I, on earth in like the 90s. I think I, Elon talked about that I before. know like, more about... It's like the most important, yes. most powerful, like the president, whoever. We have more information now than they had when they were making decisions back then, which is great, but also a curse. And then there's the flip side of technology, which is like what it's doing to our dopamine pathways. Like these things are designed to be really addictive. Yes. Which like the algorithm's only job is to show you more advertisements. And we are so easy as human beings to get addicted to things that it was like, no problem. I solved that one day one, you know, we got them, we got them watching more ads. So I, I do think that like, it's, it is a danger in the sense that like what it does to our dopamine pathways and what it does to our motivation and our creativity, because man, you can just scroll all day and get dopamine hits without exerting any effort. And then what energy do you have left for anything else? Yeah. So I can't imagine growing up having always had this because i think we were one of the last generations that grew up where our brain was developing and like our interests and, and hobbies no were phones. developing and our habits and our foundational like like core strengths were developing before this i i don't know what it's going to do i don't think anybody knows i think we're starting to see it what happens when you grow up with this technology when your brain is developing and what it does to your reward pathways because i see a lot of like younger guys now who i you know you talk to or like siblings of friends of mine who are younger that are they're really struggling with like you know ambition or drive to get up and do anything and you mix in like legal weed and these really addictive cell phones <laughs> and yeah. what that does to our dopamine and then what it does to our male hormones and boy is it like I, so I see that as well, but obviously there's still, in spite of all of that, no better time in human history to be alive. And there's so many gifts. We get to like go and make this thing right now. You couldn't have broadcast like this 20 years ago. You'd have had to have some gatekeeper like invite you to a party and then some things happen and now you have your own TV well, show. Well, well that's, that's like, my point. You didn't point. get to just have your own space like this. That's, and a, that's exactly my put point. Put out a message to the world and say whatever you want. With, with the info, the average high school physics instructor understands physics better than Isaac Newton did when he wrote Principia Jeez. in 1689. The average biologist, the average high school biology instructor yeah. understands natural selection better than Charles Darwin did in 18, uh, 1869, I believe, yeah. or 1889, I forgot what year it is. And then the average, um, the average NASA engineer understands relativity better than Albert Einstein did because he actually has to use it in order for data to come down from satellites because we, you have to use huh. relativistic, relativistic effects in order to do that. Well, Mike, what you said before about the gratitude issue, we talk about a TV show. I used to work in sports radio. I always wanted to be a radio host or whatever. You are. But that's Look my point. That. That's my point. The, the thing that goes back to what you said before, you get more impressions now doing this than if you had gotten a TV show right. when you wanted to get one. Correct. Like for you, you know, <clears throat> consistently having videos over a million views. And then the other thing is like other creators that would not, like the normal 
process to become an anchor on a TV show, I wasn't going to, I used to manage a strip club, dude. There was no fucking way I was going to get to go through those processes, right? Yeah. I wasn't going to get chosen by the fucking Hollywood industrial complex to do any of that stuff. Now I get a few million views a month, which doesn't make me famous, but still that didn't exist 30 years ago. There's like low tier level of fame that you can run a business from. This didn't exist. This concept of an influencer, you probably now with 900,000 subs on YouTube, you get more. CNN doesn't even do a one share anymore. Like with their news broadcast, you get more views than they did then. And how incredible is that when you consider that whole thing, that you're affecting more people now than you would have had you gotten your yeah, dream back in and, the day. And you have full creative control and you get to like share a message that you think is really important. And for me, that's about like, what are the stories we tell ourselves, you know, and how are they holding you back? And what could the quality of your life be like if you change the quality of stories you tell yourself. And so while what I'm doing on the internet is fun and it's spectacle, I think it opens the door to have a conversation about the power of the mind, which is something that people have been talking about for generations. And yeah. maybe like I have a different way in for people to understand that like our minds are magic and we get to decide in every moment how we want to feel and what we want our life to look like and what we want to create. And we can change tomorrow. Like we can literally, we can change right now. Right. It's every th you're just one decision away yeah, yeah. from whatever life you want to live. Yeah. You know, um, you started off in the Baltimore, D.C. area. Uh -huh. Is that where you grew yeah, up? Yeah, I grew up in Maryland. OK, I went to the University of Maryland. Oh, you're a Terrapin. Yep. OK. And then I graduated there 2005. And I was like at that time I was working in Washington, D.C. as like a bartender and a bouncer in nightclubs. So do you, like, do you know like, Melvin Fowler here? No. Melvin Fowler played center at Maryland. He was on the football oh, team. Okay. And then he played for four different NFL teams. I'll introduce you to cool. him. He's a host for uh, Tau Hakkasan. I'll introduce you awesome. to him. Awesome. Yeah. How fun. Yeah. yeah so I, I would like. While I was like getting my performing career going in college, I'd work like odd jobs at nightclubs and bars and stuff like that. Um, and then when I graduated in 2005, I moved to Washington D.C. and then I lived there for 14 years, like 2000. What's that or, like? My my experience with Washington D.C. is a lot of fucking crime and, and it's kind of scary. Uh, it's really clean, really beautiful, and wonderful people and great food. So yeah, I mean you the could food for you, sure. You yeah. could imagine it's yeah. all politics and it's really dangerous. I yeah. mean, it is a city. Things yeah. happen in every city. Yeah. It's a city. But no, it's like a clean, beautiful city with a wonderful community. It's a really small town. You know, as like a performer, you can get from one side to the other on a bike. As like, a performer, a why do you city. choose Washington? It's just because it's near where well, you I just, grew up? Yeah, I didn't choose where I was born. So okay. like naturally, as my career evolved, it was just like, it was convenient geographically. It was like the closest big city. I was like working downtown in like nightclubs and bars and meeting people and making connections and building my like events business. And, and my career was mostly around um, being a performer at corporate events during mm -hmm. that time. And Washington DC is actually the home to like most of the nonprofits in the country, oh, their okay, offices in Washington DC and all of them have annual conferences around the country, but they plan them from Washington DC. So it's actually an incredible meeting and events city and there's tons of events hosted in Washington DC. So I was very fortunate in that it was a great city to be in the events business. For sure. Um, and then over time, you know, my career got to a point where the majority of my performances were not in the city I lived in. I was going to Chicago, Miami, Las Vegas, LA, wherever it was, you know, around the world or around the country. And it occurred to me at some point, like, oh, I can live anywhere I want. Like, it's, I'm no longer performing the majority of my shows in DC. And it was like, where do I want to live? And I thought the answer was LA. I went there for, about 10 months I lasted. What and then a disaster, I, <laughs> bro. That place is such a... The same exact thing happened. I lived on the beach. I mean, it was beautiful there. I lived yeah. in Hermosa Beach, and I the could The food walk. is great. The I weather's great. I could walk great. everywhere. You can't beat yeah. the weather. I mean, there's a lot to love about California, but I found myself driving to Vegas a lot to visit friends that Every lived here. Every weekend I'd be here. And ultimately, I ended up moving here. But it started for me when I visited when I was uh, a kid. I was like 15 years old. My grandparents took me to Vegas. And so that seed to live in Las Vegas was planted a very long time ago. And I always wanted to live here. It was just sort of a matter of when. And it was really the first time that I saw, I came to Vegas, you know, 15, it would have been 98. So like, imagine what the strip looked like then. And magicians were the stars of the Las Vegas strip in the 90s and mm. early 2000s. It was like Lance Burton and Siegfried and Roy and David Copperfield, who's still here, which is mind blowing. Um, and that was the first time that I saw that you could do this for a living. I was like, oh, you can be an entertainer. You can be a performer for a living. I just thought it was something fun to do. And so that seed was planted like, oh, OK, I can do this for the rest of my life. I just thought it was this fun kind of thing. It's still this fun thing that I love doing and that I do for free. But that seed to move to Las Vegas was planted when I was 15 for sure. And from the stories my grandfather would tell me about yeah. visiting Vegas and what it was like for years before I went, 
And every year I'd say, can I go to Vegas? Can I come with you? They'd go on an annual trip and he said, no, you're too young. And then when I was 15, they were like, all right, you can come. <laughs> were you, uh, are you married now? No. Oh, okay. Uh, you, there was a video where you went to visit your girlfriend uh -huh. when she was in Vegas and you surprised her. Yeah. Did that, would that, that have any influence on you moving here? I, I knew that I was going to live here at some point in my yeah. life from when I was a teenager. Yeah. I thought about moving here multiple times in my life, you know, through my twenties. At one point I put everything in a storage unit and I was about to come here. And for whatever reason I didn't, some opportunity, usually like an opportunity came up. And so I stayed. And then ultimately like I, I wanted to move to the, I was having some health issues. And so LA was like the first step in me putting my health first. Sure. So the decision to move to LA in 2019 or 2018 was when I was sort of at the end of my battle with Lyme disease. And I was like, something has to change because I was hit this plateau and I couldn't get any better. And it was the first time in my entire life that I had made a decision strictly based off of what I was best for my health mm. versus what was best for my business. Every other choice I'd made up into that point that was what's sense. best for my business. And I said, I'm going to put my health first and where, where would be the best place for me to go right now? In LA, you know, had the weather, it had the beach. I wanted to get closer to nature. It, it was very easy to get IVs and different alternative treatments and stuff there. And so that was like a sort of a gift. It was like a, it was like a grand gesture to myself. Like, like it was like saying, you know what? It's time I put you first, and it's the first time I took that really seriously. And um, I just lived there and focused on getting better and getting healthy. And I was very lucky in that, like, I had saved up a lot of money as a performer. Yeah. And also, I continued to get calls for performing, and we weren't telling people like Max is sick and he's retired. You know, it was like, oh, he's booked. So we were just like, oh, he's already booked. So I just sounded really busy. So for everyone that was calling, it sounded like, wow, he's really busy. Every time I call with a date, he's booked. Like, could he do this event in March? He's booked. Well, I didn't even tell you the date yet, you know? Um, so yeah, and then ultimately, once I started to turn the corner on my health in LA, I started to think harder about where I wanted to live, and Vegas was the was the, the destination, and I love it here. It's the greatest place in the world to make man-on-the-street content. If you want to film so that's why you're with here. strangers yeah. on the street, Agreed. there is no better place in the world 24-7, any day of the week, you can go outside with a camera, and there will be people there, and those people will be willing to be on camera, which isn't the case in every city. In New York, it's like, get out of here with the camera, you know? Um, so that's the first piece of it, and then the other piece of it is just like, this is a place that people go to kind of just let loose and be themselves. And so I get to see human nature in it's like purest, rawest form. And so as a hypnotist, uh, Vegas really is this just like giant Petri dish. It's like my lab where I can do these human experiments and I can test things and see if they work. And then also it's a great place to produce content. Um, so I didn't necessarily move here for my business, but it turned out to be a great choice on the content side um, as far as moving here. Would you ever do a performance like those guys do, like Terry Fator or, or any of those? Um, I would love to. Um, it's not my goal right now. Yeah. If that opportunity landed in my lap, I would most certainly say yes. But my goal right now is focused on video and building my YouTube channel and telling longer stories um, and getting better at the stories that I tell and doing larger and larger stunts. If you look at the channel, you'll kind of see the progression of the last six. Because yeah. I've been doing YouTube for... I don't even know, over 10 years, but the kinds of videos I made 10 years ago are very different from now. And you can see a shift took place around November of last year. I got really serious. YouTube's my full-time job now and, and I still perform, but it's my primary focus. Yeah. Um, in the last five videos, you can see how we're, we're really, the concepts are getting bigger and we're learning, you know, hopefully you see we're getting better at telling stories. It's, it's difficult. It's really hard to tell a 25 minute story, you know, but to get back to like the, what I do the show on the strip, I, I live my life in a way where I always surrender to the opportunities that, that the universe is offering me. So I used to overthink everything mm -hmm. in my life, every opportunity that came up, every business decision, every thing that came out of left field, I would weigh the pros and cons and, mm, and, I, and usually lean towards no, because you're taught that a lot in business, which is like the power of saying no. But I would actually suggest that the real power lies in saying yes, that it is only yes that will open your life up to new possibilities because no keeps your life exactly the same, yeah. which isn't necessarily a bad thing if you like where you are, right? But the moment that I started saying yes to the unknown, and, and I'm not talking about when your friend asks you if you can help him move on a Friday afternoon. You don't have to say yes to that. I'm talking about the big opportunities, those things where you normally would really weigh the decision heavily. 
you don't know the outcome. And like to think that I know better than the universe or God or whatever you believe in, you know, I didn't mean to say God that way, God or whatever you believe in, um, is it's like, it's silly. And, and I spent so much energy saying no to things. Like I did America's Got Talent in 2020, but I was asked to do America's Got Talent probably four or five times throughout the last 20 years. And I said no every time. And every time it was because of some story I made up and that I told myself. And it undeniably was a great opportunity for me and a great outcome. And every magician I know who's ever done it, no one's ever regretted it, you know? But when I would be asked, I would come up with all these reasons not to do it. Well, I don't have control of the edit. And what if they make me look bad? And what if I fail on live TV? And what if they make me look silly? Or what if I'm not good enough? Or whatever questions you ask. And I came up with all of these reasons to say no. And instead, I, I could have just said yes, you know? And I think like that's... When you start to say yes to the opportunities that the universe is giving you, the pace of your life accelerates. That's the key thing. Yeah. I've never had more exponential growth and change because every time you say yes to that yeah. new or unknown thing, it forces you to grow and to stretch and to do something you've never done before, like perform on live television in front of millions of people or go on Twitch with 250,000 people watching and millions of people watching the clips that go viral afterwards, right? And to say, well, you can't do magic live with cameras everywhere. That you get's got to be edited. It's got to be recorded. No one's ever done that before. It's dangerous. What if? What if you mess up a trick? What if they have the wrong angle? Those are all the things I would have told myself ten years ago. Um, I read an amazing book called *The Surrender Experiment* by Michael Singer. Do you know it? I don't. Uh, he essentially realized at some point in his life that there was this voice inside his head that would always talk him out of things, and it would make up stories about things and what he said and she said. And he said, "What is this voice?" You know. And as an exercise in quieting that voice, he decided for one year he would live a surrender experiment that he would say yes to everything unknown that showed up in his life, just mm. for a year, simply to quiet that voice. So every time the voice said, "Don't do that," you don't have the time, you don't have the resources, just to show the voice who's in charge he would say yes, because, because it was like, you know, if I did that enough, it would just shut up eventually, and then I could decide. And, and any time he was at a point in his life where it was a choice between what the universe was offering him and what his ego was telling him to do, he would always choose what the universe was offering mm. for one year. And he lived that way for a year, and his life went on this crazy journey, and he decided he wanted to live that way for the rest of his life. And over the course of this book, which is his biography, he goes from being like a yogi living in the woods who just wants to meditate to being the CEO of a publicly traded company that he exits for, I don't know, $100 million or something crazy like this, while simultaneously being a yogi and living in the woods. He was just by saying yes to the unknown. So I read this book at the end of 2019, and I decided that 2020 was going to be my surrender experiment because I saw a bit of myself in that. I realized all the time in my life, I had been presented with an opportunity and I overthought it. And who knows what the outcome would have been. But I just kept saying no every time the universe offered me this, this new experience or this unknown thing or this challenging thing. And um, I decided 2020 would be my surrender experiment, that I would say yes to all the unknown. And guess what happened right at the start of 2020? A big unknown. Yeah. All of us got rocked, you know, with suddenly this new world we never expected to be in where other people were telling us how we could spend our time and where we could go and what we could do and what we could wear. And um, I thought, perfect, you know? I could have taken that as, it was really interesting timing because I had just gotten my health back. Right at the end of 2019, mm. I had stopped performing for three years. I went from thinking I'd never perform again to suddenly like, okay, I have the energy. Maybe I'll do a few shows. So, yeah, maybe I'll do a few shows in 2020. Guess what happened? All the theaters in the world were closed, no events, you know, no live entertainment, nothing like that. And I could have been like, damn, I just got my health back. This is bullshit. What is this? But instead, I decided I was going to have a surrender experiment. And I was like, how fun. Okay, how interesting. What's going to happen next? And then I started making a lot of online content. I, I had uh, you know, kind of gone all in on that at the end of 2019. And so I was still making content in 2020. And one video somewhere got seen by someone on America's Got Talent. And they called and they said, hey, do you want to do America's Got Talent? I said, yes. They said, oh, well, we didn't tell you. It's kind of a weird season. I said, yes. They said, but it's going to be, there's not going to be an audience. I said, yes, don't worry about it. Doesn't matter. I don't care. I'm in you know, let's do it. And um, I did it for a year. And I decided that that's the way that I wanted to live the rest of my life as well. And so I'm not perfect, but I do my best anytime I'm presented with just something I never expected to just go, okay, let's do it. And every time I've done it, it's opened my life up to new relationships and new possibilities. And I couldn't imagine going back to like overthinking every invitation and every opportunity and every big decision. Just say yes, you don't know what's going to happen. So just say yes. Uh, you mentioned before, do you have a team 
that works with you? Like, I have one full-time employee okay. who um, is a shooter editor. His okay, name's that's Adam. Adam's it. incredible. Um, we've been working together for about a year now on videos. Like all of my most viral videos were shot and, and edited by him. Uh, we have a little studio here in Vegas where we, you know, just get together and work on our videos and our content. Um, and then I'm managed by Night Media, which is uh, Mr. Beast management company. Well, he's managed by them as well. Um, they have some of the best talent in the world. I'm really honored to, they asked me to be on their roster at the end of this past year. So that's Kai Sinat, Mr. Beast, Ryan Trahan, you know, just the biggest names on the internet. Um, so they handle everything on the digital side. Um, I still wholly own my events business. I carved that out with them. They were really generous in the contract terms. I spent 20 years building my events business, so I wasn't ready to hand that over to someone. But on the digital side, they fully manage that business. Um, and then on the event side, um, I had a guy named Daniel that was my full-time salesperson for the last um, eight or nine years. Uh, he moved on to like focus on his music career, which is beautiful. It's like mm -hmm. the best thing that ever could have happened to him. It's what I always wanted for him. Um, so the the like events business is back on me and like my assistant. Um, but then I have vendors that I work with. So I have an extended team. Like I have a dedicated thumbnail artist for my YouTube videos. I have people that I work with on script writing and like the intros of my YouTube video. Intros are really difficult. Um, I have people that I bring in to brainstorm for new ideas. When I have a big performance like a Kai Sinat, I work with a team. Like we prepare for those performances as if it were a TV special. You mm. know, for we get together for two weeks or three weeks to plan like every moment of what's going to happen over the course of the hour that I'm on with him live all of the things that I'm going to perform, all the things that we want to try to pull off, the words that I'm going to use. And yes, it's organic and it happens in real time, but we've put as much thought into those performances as like David Blaine would for a TV special. As far as the resources we commit to it and the time and the energy and the brain trust and the amount of rehearsal, I don't treat it like it's an internet video. I recognize that this is the future. It is here now. It is the largest medium and opportunity of our lifetime as entertainers and content producers and yeah. people who have a story that they want to tell and we take it just as seriously. So I have one full-time employee, but I have a huge team. Uh, I realized like, I always thought like you had to do everything yourself. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs go through that. If I want it right, I got to do it myself. And the frustration of train training other people and letting go and giving up control. And then I realized like eventually that leads to burnout. You can't do everything yourself. And then on top of that, guess what? There are people who are better, better than, than you, you. Yeah. at those things too. So not only do you not have to do everything yourself, but you can find people who are better than you at the things um, that you want to do. Have you read uh, Dan Martell's book, Buy Back Your Time? No. You should definitely check that out. Cool. He goes it, formulas on how to hire people to get to get Sweet. all these things. And that's why. That'd like, be really helpful for it's, me. It's been my team there. Part of their job is to yeah. find ways to replace me in different parts of the business. Amazing. Yeah. So that's like on the business side. And then on the creative side, when it comes to team and collaboration, I had another misconception, which was that creativity was this gift an individual had. Mm. And some people had it and some people didn't. Um, and I, I believed I was not creative, right? So like that just wasn't me. That's not the hand that I got dealt. I'm a great performer and presenter and speaker, but I, I'm not creative. I'm good at running a business. I'm not creative. It's, it's not true. Um, but I, I realized that creativity is actually a skill and it's a learned skill and it's a process and it's a way of thinking and that everyone is creative. It's our nature. We are creators by nature. It's what we do, right? We're creative animals. But I also had this misconception that creativity was a result of isolation. I had this picture in my head of this lone creative genius who like went and toiled away alone in the studio, probably like early morning or late at night. That's when they do that stuff, right? Fueled by like you know, caffeine and stacks of books and notes. And, and then they emerged one day with their masterpiece. And I thought that's what creativity was. It was this lone, solo, creative genius. And then I realized that like most of the creativity you see in the world is a, resa a result of collaboration and not isolation. And I was approaching it as if I had to do it all myself because that's what makes an idea your own. And I realized that collaboration is the key to creativity, not isolation. And so I started bringing in new perspectives and more conversations and sharing freely and not being afraid to share ideas. Some people are afraid to say something because someone else might steal it, but then the idea doesn't grow. So you have to talk about it, you have to share. Maybe you have your trusted circle, right? But that ideas, they really sort of suffer and wither and die in isolation and they really grow and blossom and become something bigger 
through collaboration. And so like opening my life up to like more collaboration and more creative conversations and even taking perspectives from people who aren't in the magic or mentalism or hypnosis world, like listening to ideas that my girlfriend has or that like a random thing you hear a person say, like when they watch one of your videos, like, oh, I thought you were going to do X, Y, Z. Or when I'm in the middle of performing, someone might say like, he's about to do blank and I'm not about to do blank, but I'm like, darn, that's a really good idea. I should mm. figure out a way to do that next. So recognizing like that collaboration is not just an active thing that you sit down to do with another person. Like we're going to collaborate today. We're going to brainstorm, but it's an ongoing conversation you have with the world around you. So collaboration is like noticing the book on the shelf or overhearing something someone says in line while you're waiting for a coffee at Vesta or Mothership, you know, here in Las Vegas. And it sparks an idea inside your head. So I'm like constantly collaborating with the universe and the things that I'm taking in and all of the ideas um, and then consuming other art. I mean, I think that's another way to be creative is just to like take in more art, watch movies, you know, take yourself on a date as an artist, like go to an art exhibit or something by yourself, which I think is sometimes it's fun to do with other people, but once in a while, go consume some art by yourself and take that in and just have that time to like fill the well up, so yeah. to speak. And then you, you, your brain will make the connections in the background. And then like, you'll realize like this idea you had was a result of this conversation and this thing you read and this thing you saw, if you traced it back, you know, I, I found a drawing like I made when I was a little kid before I wanted to be a magician of like a magician superhero. I found this last night in a book. I like unpacked all these books that I had in storage and inside of this spiral bound like notebook was a piece of paper sticking out and it was a color pencil drawing of this red and yellow superhero. His name was Misto and he was a magician. Like what the hell? Like I, I like had this vision of like uh, being. Do you a remember as, making it? No, oh. but it's definitely my handwriting, and I. Yeah. That's the style I drew in when I was a kid. I don't remember making it at all, but I, it's definitely I made it. It's my handwriting, and I wrote little notes next to him that he'd be wearing camo pants. Isn't that funny? And I'm, I didn't do this intentionally <laughs> today, but like I, I wear camo pants all the time, and like as an adult. And at that point in my life, I never wore camo pants yeah. as a kid. So it was like weird. His costume involved camo pants and he was a magician. It's really strange, like the connections that our brain makes. And I don't know, it takes us back to free will. Like, I, I don't know. How did we get here? You know, like, how did all those stars align? My grandfather going to Las Vegas, me drawing this picture when I was a kid. I, a random trip to a magic shop in the mall with my mom. Like, you know, it's like the first time I saw magic. Yeah, how does it? And then here we are. But it's also like a choice to be like, to live life that way too, right? Because you could have all of those like moments and circumstances and you could choose to ignore them or you could be told to ignore them, which I think like is probably the greatest crime like a parent could commit would be telling their kids they can't do something. Sure. Like you have to be this. And I, I don't think I realized growing up how lucky I was that my parents gave me permission to do whatever I wanted. Like they really did like come home when it gets dark, but not just that, like how I wanted to spend my time and what kind of life I wanted to build. And they didn't say, oh, you have to go to college. They didn't say, oh, you have to be a doctor. Oh, you should be realistic. Oh, you should probably have a backup plan. What's your plan B? They were like, you want to be a magician? Great. Be a magician. Be the greatest magician in the world. You know, and they gave me permission to do what I wanted. I think that they didn't have a lot of financial resources, but they gave me permission to be what I wanted to be. And then as I got to college, I realized like so many kids that was in their life. Like my first girlfriend, I remember like sh her telling me like the way that her parents talked to her about life and work and oh no, you have to do this. You have to live this way. You have to be an engineer. You have to be a doctor, whatever it is. It just wasn't even an option. And so like, I'm lucky in the sense that like, I was born in a house that allowed me to like explore my curiosity. So it's like that combination of the random things that life exposes you to and maybe the signs the universe is trying to give you and then like you having permission to explore that if you're a child and then also like you making the choice to explore that once you're an adult because maybe i'm fortunate in that the thing that was my calling in life i naturally stumbled on as a kid yeah i'm very lucky but it's also something that every kid stumbles on like every boy learns a card trick or a magic trick right yeah. So like I was destined to find that during childhood. And then my dad was hypnotized when I was 18. So he could quit smoking. So I discovered hypnosis. I might not have found that thing. That's my thing until I was 50. So I, I recognize I'm so lucky, but there also is like that personal part where you, you have to recognize that whisper, that thing that keeps talking to you. If you've been thinking your whole life about doing this thing and telling yourself you can't like that's maybe a time when it is important to listen to that voice inside your head, not the negative one, but the one that says, what if? 
What if I did this? What if I did that? What if I lived in a whole new way? What if I tried? What if I just tried? You know, because if anyone else has ever done it in the history of humanity, guess what? You can too. Um, so maybe just a call to action to just like, if there's that thing that's, I think Oprah calls it a whisper. It's like that, that voice that gets louder over time. If you don't listen to it, you know, that's telling you maybe there's some other way to live or some other thing to focus on, or that life doesn't have to be this way. Like that's like the one instance where I would encourage you to listen to that voice inside your head because, you know, that nudge can change the direction of your whole life. And you've probably been getting those nudges and those whispers your whole life. And you probably know what that thing is. You probably could point to it if I forced you to, you know, uh, we're very lucky in that, like we've found that thing that lights us up and we get to like wake up every day and do something we find so exciting. Yeah. And I recognize the reality of life that not everyone can do that. But, um, if you have the opportunity to do it, just go for it. You know, I, I nobody's special, but at the same time, we're all special. Like, isn't that so interesting? Like, I'm not special. You're not special. Like, anybody can start a podcast. But at the same time, like, we're all special. Like, that's beautiful, too. Here we are. We're born. We get to have this. We get to be alive during the greatest time in human history. Exactly. As that book said. So, yeah, you know, just just go for it. Like, whatever that thing is that you're hesitating on, whatever that opportunity the universe is giving you that you're overthinking, just say yes to the unknown. Uh, more specifically, your monthly and weekly schedule. How many days a month are you out doing Man on the Street videos? Mm -hmm. By the way, if you want a crowd, uh, let me know. You should I, come. I, I Just got a, come. I got a big group of yeah, girls. Yeah. I'll bring them so, out with you, and we can we can. You watch can come. This. You don't have to bring the girls. Okay. But there's plenty of people on the street we'll okay. perform for. But you should come because then we can talk about what's happening. Um, because like. There's nothing like seeing it in person. Of course. And I see how interested you are in psychology and influence yeah. in this stuff and seeing it firsthand. Like you have enough of a framework now that if you watched me, because when you see a video on the internet, you see 30 seconds of my interaction with someone. You, you can't know the whole story. It's just impossible. I mean, shorts force you to tell the story in yeah. under 60 seconds. So I'm not saying we're hiding anything. I'm just saying you, you can't get what it takes to have that experience. Like I have to meet a stranger. Like, how do you disarm them? How do you build confidence, rapport, and trust? And so I think you would be fascinated in seeing how it, how it goes from we just, like, walk out the door to approach a group. We get shut down by groups. Some people are like, get away from me. Don't film me. You know, like, and we keep going and how we take it from, like, being like, I don't think that stuff's really real or you could never hypnotize me to moments later, you know, this six-foot-four grown man is, like, laid out on the ground after he just said he couldn't be hypnotized. So I think you would be fascinated in seeing it on the street. It would be kind of like a crash course and in influence, you know, in the most guerrilla fashion. Yeah. So you should definitely come out with us uh, when we do these do, streams. As far as when, yeah. it's really sporadic. Um, it just is based off of right now we're focused more on the big projects. So those get all of our attention. I used to be focused on shorts and reels and TikToks. And so I would put out like one a day and at times I did one a week. And I would say as someone who's built an audience online, there's still like no substitute. The current algorithm is discovery based. So what that means is it doesn't matter how many followers you have or how many subscribers you have. For instance, on YouTube, I have 900,000 subscribers, but at times I have 25 million returning viewers each month. Yeah. So, so the subscriber metric and the follower metric is, is dead. They are vanity metrics, at least the way the algorithm is now. Correct. It means nothing to have a million followers if 2,000 people watch your video. And I know people that have I that. I see them all the whether time. Whether it's because they built a big audience and they stopped creating content so the algorithm got out of their favor, or maybe their content didn't evolve and it became less interesting and they say, I'm shadow banned, but really they just create shitty content. You know, or they bought followers. Either way, followers don't equal visibility. So um, if you are in business and content is part of your the, your business, then still right now there is this outsized opportunity of discovery where it used to matter that you had a lot of followers because they would see your video and they would share it. Now it's algorithm-based. So if you like football and this guy likes football, but he also likes Kai Sinet, it might go, okay, well, maybe we show him a Kai Sinat video. And then it's looking for audiences that yeah. might be a bad analogy. No, it's triangulating but it's, but it's looking, audiences. It's looking yeah. for interests that you might not even realize make you interested in a subject. And then it's finding someone that looks like you because you watched that video to the completion. And so it's it's pushing your video. If you make a good video and you have zero followers, it will find an audience and go viral. Yeah, definitely. Regardless of what your last video did, which is wild as well. There's just no penalty for making bad content. And the beautiful thing is people used to be scared of reps, but now if you have 
1.7 million followers on TikTok like I do, and you make a bad video, guess how many people are going to see that video? TikTok is the most extreme. Like, yeah. like sometimes like 300 people. Yeah. You're like, I have 1.7 million followers. What the hell is that possible? But what's great about that is if I make a bad piece of content, I don't have to worry about Nobody it because nobody's going to see it. Yeah. If I make a great piece of content, everybody's going to see it, my followers and the algorithm. So when I was really focused on growing my audience, um, we did a video a day, which I think still is the formula for TikTok and Reels and, I'm and, going, yeah. and Instagram. Um, you know, if you have a video that's a banger, like repost it nine months later, yes. just like as is. You don't even have to change it if so it my worked team then. Does, yeah. If it worked then, repost it. It should be nine months later. My team will repost it like a couple of weeks later. I, I've like, done that too. Like, and chill it out. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that's really growth rate. But now we're focused on long form content, and some of these projects take a long time, like to to do and to shoot. Um, uh, I just did a video with uh, Travis Pastrana. He's like the greatest daredevil alive. Okay. He's the guy that first did a backflip on a dirt bike. He okay. drives monster trucks and uh, rally cars. Wow. And he's just the modern day evil Knievel. And uh, he came here for a car race here in Las Vegas called Nitro Cross, um, which Dana White's affiliated with. I think he's part owner of that organization. So it's like a startup race car series. They're these electric rally cars that are faster than Formula One, and they're going off of dirt jumps, clearing like 80-foot gaps. It's insane. It's like the coolest car race I've ever seen. And I went there. Uh, he took me on a ride along, and then uh, I went and performed around the stands for people in the crowd, like a Street Magic special. And then at the end of the video, I set up a challenge for him where I took him on a drive in my car, uh, where I was blindfolded. So like he took me on a ride along, showed me what he could do. And then at the end of the video, I take him on a ride along. And so that's something that took a lot of preparation to be able to do, you know, we're on this closed course that I had to memorize, um, trying to scare the shit out of him in the car, driving around while I'm blindfolded. There's a few plot twists along the way. You'll have to wait and see the video. Um, but that took a tremendous amount of time to plan and to execute. And now in post-production, it's the largest project we've ever done. There's like seven GoPros in the car. I had two camera guys filming there. We have like a terabyte of footage, which is insane. Um, so this is like Mr. Beast type It's like a three-day shoot. Yeah so, yeah. so because my focus has shifted towards learning to tell longer stories, I'm not as focused on growth right now and on the shorts output. It's just a bandwidth question for of course. me. I think if I had a larger team, but... Also, like, I just recognize, like, the depth of the relationship you have with an audience on a 25-minute video versus a 30-second video. You can't, you can't compare it. And I live agree. streaming, too, the depth of relationship you have in live streaming versus um, shorts and recorded content is insane uh, and podcasts and people who listen regularly. So, yeah, I'm just focused on, like, um, telling the best stories possible, doing, like, some of the coolest stunts and experiments I think have ever done been done on camera and doing it in my own unique way and learning to storytell and edit and building my team and um, that community online. So yeah, YouTube long form is my focus. So we're, you know, I, I work seven days a week, like most entrepreneurs. Um, my time is really split between traveling for performances and the content. Um, I've started taking less and less performances so I could have more time for content because I found if I'm traveling all the time, it's just really hard to make videos. Both I'm like physically kind of tired and also it just you have to be here to, to film. And I'm really involved in the edits right now. So my voice is really in that content. Um, so, yeah, it's like right now I have two full time jobs, you know, but I am shifting the focus of my time towards video and away from the amount of performances I do, but that doesn't mean I don't take performing as serious as I ever did. I just um, got invited to be part of Aspire Tour, which is this awesome speaking tour. Uh, my buddy, uh, Dan Fleischman, yeah, is, they had is part of that. Yeah. Fleischman, David Goggins has been on there. Fleischman's yeah. one of the partners, um, him and Andrew Cordell. Um, and um, they put on an incredible production. And so that was really cool to take what I do as a performer and present it in a setting where people are really there to take their life to the next level. Oh, so you level. did it up on the stage. I've been on some of the panels for Aspire. Yeah, yeah. so okay, no, I was cool. on the main stage right nice. after lunch. Great time slot for me. People are tired. They come back, and I wake the whole room up. And the people who are in that room, if you don't know what Aspire is, it's sort of like a entrepreneurs and individuals who want to take their life to the next level. So they're there. They're learning. On the one hand, they're learning tax strategy and yeah. investment and retirement. On the other hand, they're learning, you know, like motivation from Magic Johnson or David Goggins yeah. or the biggest speakers in the world are on this stage. So it was really cool to have an audience where I got to perform and do my thing and be entertaining, but then also um, teach them about their mind because it's really fun to work with someone who's already performing at a really high level and just teach them how to unlock that little, that little extra edge, you know, because no matter where you're at in your life, you have a story you're telling yourself. Oh. Um, and oftentimes the most successful people tell themselves the nastiest stories because it's part of how they got there. Yeah. You know, the most common limiting belief that people hold is I'm not worthy or I'm not good enough. 
And coincidentally, a lot of professional athletes and billionaires and businessmen and executives and leaders, they have that story. And it's part of what drove them to push so hard was I'm not good enough. I have to show the world or I'm not worthy of love. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to earn it. And while that might have helped them get to that point, there does come a point in your life where that no longer serves you. And you're running by that program and you're limiting your experience of life. Uh, but the problem is that it, it can be scary to let go of a story like that because it's part of what got you where you are. I've worked with um, a former UFC champion to help them unlock a new level of performance. And it was a little bit scary for them to let go of this idea because it was like, well, that's what made me great. That's my edge. And if I let go of that, I'm going to lose that. But here's the beautiful thing. We can let go of the stories we tell ourselves about the past and we can hang on to all the lessons. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. We can keep the strengths and we can take all the learnings because people always say, can you help me forget about this thing that happened to me? They say it jokingly, but they're serious as well. Can you make me forget about my ex? Can you make me forget about this? We actually don't want to forget the past because if we forget the past and we forget the things that happened to us, we not only lose the pain, but we also lose the lessons. And guess what? Our soul is on a journey where we're going to have to learn that lesson again. If we don't learn it, that's why we face the similar situations over and over in our lives until we learn the lesson. It's like life saying, you got to learn this or it's going to keep happening. And so if we forget the past, then we lose the lesson as well. And we will inevitably have to learn that lesson again. And it might be even more painful than the first time. Um, so we can let go of the pain and the regret and the fear, and we can forgive and all the anxiety, and we can hang on to the strengths and the lessons and all the things that made us great because you're here who you are 40 some years, a product of everything you've uh, experienced in your life. And you have what I can see as like an incredible drive and work ethic and emotional regulation. Can anyone take your, your drive away from you? No. That's yours. You yeah, earned that. Mine, and I yeah. don't know what you've been through that, that resulted in that. Yeah. I'm sure there's some things that shaped that part of you. Yeah. There were times where someone could, but yeah. not now. Right. Yeah. And that's my point is yeah. that you earned that. That's part of who you are. And now you can, you, I'm speaking generally, not you, yes. but you can let go of those things and you're not at risk of losing that edge. And if anything, you'll find that your art, your performance flourishes. There's so many stories of artists and musicians who were like afraid to let go of their drug addiction or their alcoholism or, you know, cause in a weird way they thought like, no, that's part of like my process or my edge and I'm going to yeah. lose. But then they find when they do, that was just a crutch and they create their best work ever, you know, when they're sober or free of this habit or this belief or whatever it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was actually Dan Fleischman. Uh, I was at dinner with him one time and Ty Lopez and I was showing him cause I didn't like what my engagement was doing. Uh, cause we started posting more and more stuff and the stuff that I was posting was getting more and more controversial. And then he showed me this metric, and I'm sure it's something you've seen too, is that I, there was a, a week where I got as many likes as, as I got as many shares as likes. Hmm. And then it was like 100,000 shares, and then like a few right. more. Right, well, sometimes people are hesitant to click the heart on something. Yes, that's because exactly Because they're right. afraid either the algorithm's going to punish them for interacting with that controversial content. Yeah. You know, I... I you know, question sometimes clicking on things. And then I am frustrated with myself for censoring my own behavior. I'm like, okay, they're winning. Cause like, I'm afraid to click that, even though I agree with it. That's a real thing. It happens, right? They don't want to get their own reach limited or they're afraid what other people will think. Because when you like something, people can see what you liked or interacted with. It'll show up and say, you know, so-and-so liked this post. You might like it too. And it's like, why are they interacting with that? Um, so yeah, sometimes people will share things quietly and DM things to their friends, or they'll take the link and send it in a text message because they don't want the, uh, you know, it's like they're like scared of Instagram might see what they're reading or sharing, or and then it'll affect their reach, and it might. I don't know if it does or not, but I know that we're concerned about it, and if you're concerned about it, then that's as good as censorship because it's like affecting how you behave because you're afraid what the platform might do or what someone else might think. Yeah, that was the thing. But when you talk about vanity metrics, that was yeah. a big one for me. I was like, cause I, cause he showed it to me. He's mm. like, dude, these people are sharing your content. Like he goes, I know models with 9 million followers who don't get their content shared this much. Well, it's, it's like a focus on significance over maybe growth or service. Yes. And, and I think if we're focused on significance in life, it's like really easy to get down on ourselves if we don't get the outcome because significance is tied to outcome. So like if my priority is significance in life, then if I don't achieve the outcome that I of was course. after, like let's say I really wanted to win America's Got Talent and that my drive to do that was fame and fortune and significance. And then I lose, air quotes, I, I don't get first place, right? I'm not voted, you know, as like mind reading being cooler than singing. I don't know how you compare the two, right? Um, 
then then I would feel like I lost because my my sense of accomplishment or self worth was derived from significance. Versus if my goal was growth, if that was my number one priority, then I can't lose. Because no matter what happens, I'm going to learn something about myself, about the process of performing on camera. Um, and then, you know, you talk about impact and service. Like if one person, if this video that we're making right now gets one view, and if it changes that one person's life, wasn't it worth it? We're going to go for one view this week, guys. We've got one view. We're going to at least get that way. We, we but, but imagine get a, that, that no, you're one right, person right. So, gets reached or touched you know, and this yeah. conversation is a flop in the algorithm or doesn't get liked or doesn't get shared or whatever. But for one person, it's exactly the thing that they needed to hear to change their life or change direction or let go of the stories that they're telling themselves yes. or whatever your goal is, you know, in service of creating this podcast, you know, of a, someone evolving or thinking about life differently. Then I would say that we achieved our goal. So sometimes when I find myself getting frustrated, I, I have to like go inside and recognize well, like, how am I valuing the content that I'm creating? And if I'm valuing it by views, then like it's, it's really easy to get frustrated because it is this, it's this amorphous thing that we have to please. And like, maybe the video is great, but I haven't given the algorithm enough videos recently. And they'll never so explain gonna, the algorithm so to So it's going to punish me yeah. because it's like, no, nope, nope, you went away for three months. You don't get to come back and have a viral video. You got to, you know, so it's like this weird game that's being played, not just with, if you're someone who just consumes content, there's the, there's another side of the algorithm, which is the creator, which feels like this abusive thing, doesn't it? It feels like it's, it's as well as it's manipulated the viewer to spend more time on the app it's, it's also me. training you to feed it it's like if yeah. you don't mm -mm, not like you didn't follow the rules you didn't put a video up or you took a break for three months you don't get to come back and just have a banger right out of the gates even if it's the most admit you like walked on water I'm sorry YouTube I haven't I didn't put out an episode last you know? week I'm YouTube sorry. is the most forgiving yeah YouTube is the oh, most oh, yeah, forgiving right, yeah. of all platforms you can disappear and come back and if it's a great video it'll fly TikTok really feels like if you take a break it's like mm -mm. and it's like the performance of that video is based off of of how much content you fed it lately and and like it's like they let you win the lottery once in a while if you give it enough content oh, that's crazy I, it really I, feels yeah. that way doesn't it yeah, and so it it's this weird thing where spike. the where the algorithm is manipulating you as a creator as well because it's giving you that validation of the views right and so it, it is this amorphous thing that feels a little abusive at times and it gets you to focus on the wrong things and it's really easy when that number is displayed you know, really big. I think Elon talked about taking retweets and likes off of tweets so we could just like see the information and yeah. not measure it off of this metric. We just take the information for what it is. Yeah. And I think that maybe that's not a bad idea, you know, for like a creator too to not even know how many people saw something, to just see the conversation that's happening under it. Because like every time in my life where I thought about stopping making content, which isn't now, but there were times when I did, right at the moment I was like, you know what, I'm not going to make videos anymore. I would always get a DM from someone who's like, you don't know how much your videos have impacted me. Yeah. And you're like, what? 150 people watch that, you know, which also we're like numb to numbers now, like a thousand views. If you put on an event and a thousand people showed It'd up, be incredible. that would be amazing. be amazing to sell a thousand tickets is one of the hardest things to do as a live performer, comedy performer. That's a huge venue. A yeah. thousand tickets is a huge venue, right? Like to sell a thousand tickets to something, to have a thousand people show up to see your work is unbelievable. I used to do live touring and it's uh, selling tickets is the hardest thing in the world it to is. get people to sit down in a seat and watch your show or go to your workshop or the Aspire tour or whatever it is. And so like we see a video and like, you know, I'm guilty of it. I, you know, my one video with Kai Sinat does 2.5 million views on a, on a 25 minute video. And then like my next video gets 30,000 views and I'm like, no one saw this. 30,000 people watch that video. Like yeah. that's a stadium. What if a stadium showed up to watch me do something for 25 minutes? I would be like, this is the coolest thing ever. So yeah, it's so strange like how we over time, I don't know if you follow this podcast called Colin and Samir. They, they talk to podcasters and other content creators about the life of being a creator. And they talk about relative zero. What's your relative zero? And it's different for everyone. Like Mr. Beast would say, if, if one of his videos got 10 million views, he would say no one watched it. Yeah. Any of us would die for a long form video 10 million, to get 10 million yeah. views, you know? And I think his new relative zero, he said, is 100 million. He like knows this. That's you know? crazy. So for him, for a video to be good, it's 200 million now. It's just like the bar keeps moving. So like when I recognized that happening in myself, I was like, what's my relative zero? 
And I think it's something like 250,000 views, sure. which is so strange because 10 years ago, if 30,000 people watched a video that I created, I'd have been like, what is happening? You know, what is going on? And then, you know, I have a short that gets 50 million views on three platforms. And it's like, you can't even wrap your head around these numbers. It's like, what is it? And so, yes, it's very easy to get sucked into the numbers and forget that these numbers are human beings. These are real people. It's not a number. It's not an algorithm. It's a human and, and your work has the ability, your message has the ability to reach them, which is an incredible gift that we're not behind, um, you know, some paywall or we have to go through some network to get, uh, you know, I tried to get a cable TV show for like 2013, 14, 15, and you'd go to these meetings and like have to t convince people that you're great and like sell yourself and, and find a way to conform what you do to their world and like mold yourself into their box instead of being who you are. And it was just wild, like, you know, that there are these people who get to decide who gets to tell a story. Yeah. So, yeah, we're so lucky. But it is a, have been removed. it's a slippery slope. You, you have to check yourself um, as a content creator for sure. It's <laughs> relative zero. Such an interesting term. So going back to what you said before. So I'm a performance coach and I, I have a high ticket uh, coaching program. Uh -huh. And so I'll have a guy. He'll come on, talk to the sales guy. Uh, talk to our closer and he'll be like well the reason why i joined was because i saw michael do this on this mm -hmm. and it's not some video it's not when i go on some big podcast it'll be some interview some inane interview i did mm. where i was like dude bro i don't even remember that i did that yeah. i've done 500 interviews on my interview wow. uh, sheet, sheet and then um and then the guy will be like oh you remember that one uh video you did on conquering limiting beliefs i was like yeah i was like yeah i just joined because of that <laughs> And then you come to the realization that you can have 10,000 followers on Instagram and run a really good business. You can have, you can be an esthetician, an accountant. There's yeah. so many ways. You don't need 100,000 no, followers. No, you man. actually need 1,000 true fans. Yeah. There's a great essay on that. You yeah. just search 1,000 true fans. But the math of 1,000 true fans, meaning like 1,000 people who will support and buy everything you put out, is that's a business. Yeah. 1,000 true fans is a business. Yeah, it, it really yeah. is. And what you're saying before with, about relative zero, I would get upset and then we'd look at our sales numbers and we quadruple every year. And I was like, okay, we're doing something right. And so I keep explaining, I keep going to, when I we go to a C-suite, a meeting, I keep expecting to get yelled at because one video didn't do well. And the two guys are like, yeah, we double profits this month. And I was like, okay. And then I remember what, I remember what Dan Fleischman told me. And he was like, hey, man, look at the shares. Don't look at the likes anymore. And I did that, and it's, it's absolutely exactly what you've been saying before. Like, it's something different. Yeah, share says this meant something to me. Yes. Like, but, is, I, I, I like stuff. I don't even remember hitting like yeah. on it sometimes. You know what I mean? Well, also, I'll share something and forget to go back and like yeah, or it. Or I'll just hit like because it's a friend I recognize. Yes. I just want to support them. So I just see it. I Maybe I didn't watch it. I'll go back later, and I swipe past it. But a, a share means, like, this is worth your time, and it was worth my time, and this meant something to me. So, yeah, that's really cool. I haven't thought about that. Um, how, I'm sure when you first became a content creator, you had to deal, your negative press is probably much different than mine. What 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 kind of negativity have you dealt with uh -huh. on He's the He's a comments? demon. Or do you not care He's at all? He's a demon. He yeah. works with gins. You yeah. know, save yourself. Find yeah. Jesus. That's all my negativity. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I think that gene just was switched off in me to care about criticism. Uh, maybe I never had it, or maybe it's because I've been performing for my whole life. I just either got that out of my system early, or I never learned to care about the negative things other people said. Because, like, if you do anything um, outside the box as a kid, or really at any point in life, you'll always get criticism. So I think because I was performing when I was so young, I just, I'd never... I think I remember like one show where I was a little bit nervous. You know, people asked me about stage fright. I, I remember like one show where I was like a tiny bit nervous. And one of my mentors, his name was Lou Pelea. He was like a local magician in Westminster, Maryland. Um, he was like there, like comforting me before I went on stage for this show. It's like, I think it's, this is maybe the only show I ever remember being nervous. And he said, just remember, they all put their pants on one leg at a time, like yeah. you. And I was like, thanks, Mr. Lou. And um, the other piece of advice that helped uh, on the stage fright side, and then we'll get back to the what others say, was another mentor of mine, Denny Haney. He ran a magic shop in Baltimore. He was just such a wonderful human that taught so many generations of magicians. Um, he said, the audience has no idea what's going to happen next. So people always ask, what do you do if something goes wrong on stage? And, and his lesson was, you're the only person that knows what's about to happen next. So if you don't get frustrated or upset by it, they won't even know anything wrong and happens. Is this happened to you when you first started with these acts? It still it, happens today that, yeah. that I'm the only one that knows where it's going. And that's great because I get to de decide what success and failure looks like. You know what I mean? Um, so I think like, you know, if you're a dancer, for example, and you have this choreographed dance and you miss a step, me as a 
layman in the audience, I have no idea you missed a step. You just keep going. But if you stop and you beat yourself up, I'm like, oh, she did something wrong. She screwed up, right? So that's on the one side of like, you know, stage fright. And then on the caring what people think, I, I think I just have just been in front of crowds my whole life. I, even if it wasn't on video, I have just been performing my whole life. And I just never, I never really allowed negativity to affect me. I, I just, I can't, yeah, I don't know. I don't feel like I've ever read a comment that somebody sent on the internet and, uh, it, it, it made me feel bad. I, I think it's just, it's, it's just noise, you know, cause I recognize that like my own thoughts aren't even true. Mm -hmm. So like, why would I give weight to like what some anonymous person says on the internet? You know? Yeah. But also, like, I only take criticism from people who are, like, doing the thing that I want to do at the yes, level I, I want to I do. I say I wor worship at the altar of worthless people or worthless opinions. Worship yeah. at the—people worship at the like, altar why, of worthless Why would opinions. I care what, like, someone who's—yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I think you get where I'm going with this. But it's just—I it's just I think I'm lucky and that I've been doing this for so long that I—even pre-internet, I was doing this. So I was—just become immune or not immune. I just never— never had that gene to, to care what people think because I think I, I just started performing so early and you're, you face criticism as a performer and that stage fright is that fear of what other people are going to think. So that kind of is that fear of criticism. That's kind of what stage fright points to, yeah. right? Stage fright also points to a lack of preparation. It's like the most common cure for stage fright is just you didn't prepare enough. So like if you're nervous, it's probably like mm, it's part of you knows. That's like, what uh, worked harder, buddy. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. what my instructor when I was in the Air Force, when I was going through nav instructor training, yeah. he was like, the reason why you're getting nauseous in some of these flights is because you're not prepared enough. Yeah, and he was completely right. When I started doing that, it's it also changes. stage fright or nervousness, for example, um, is also just you mislabeling a physical phenomenon. Mm. So excitement and nervousness have the same physical sensations in the body. The only difference is the story that you're telling yourself or the way that you're labeling it. So like if you're uh, standing in the wings, getting ready to go on stage for a big talk or a workshop you're yeah. putting on, it, let's let's take preparedness out of it. Let's say you are prepared, you're an expert in this field, and you are prepared for this particular talk. You've been doing this whole life. You can do it with your eyes closed. If you, if you find yourself nervous in that moment, um, it could just be excitement. You're excited to go on stage and yeah. you want to do a great job and you want to serve these people. And so... Uh, a great tool for anyone experiencing nervousness before a big performance, sales meeting, proposal, anything they're going to walk into is to just say out loud, I'm excited. So you're just you're just reframing that thing, that you, physical sensation that you're feeling, and you're taking it from being a negative connotation and association to a positive one. So I'm excited is is really a powerful thing to say when you're feeling nervous because it's the same physical sensations in the body. Have you ever used any of these skills on a date? <laughs> it's um, every long-term relationship I've ever been on, I've ever been in, this stuff hasn't worked. So it's like <laughs> the person I ended up dating... Um, um, She's the one who wouldn't is, be hypnotized. She's like immune to my yeah. bullshit <laughs> or whatever it is yeah. and can read me like a book and I can't read them. It's yeah. That's been the common theme is like they can read me like a book and I can't read them. So maybe that's the attraction is like the they're, they're this anomaly. Was... Uh was Vegas. So when I moved to Vegas, I'm not going to lie, the women were one of the reasons why I moved here. Was there any other reason besides that? I know you you talked about doing Men on the Street. Is it the, you like the nightclubs here, the shows, I, the I, girls, I like the, the restaurants? Energy, um, yeah, of the city. I it's just a very exciting place to be. I think it's that romantic vision of it when I was a kid, and and I think that's the biggest piece of it. Um, and then just a thing I always just wanted to do. And I felt like I just had to, at some point I just have to live in Vegas cause I've always wanted to. And then once I got here, I love the weather. Um, Me too. and, and, uh, it's until recently, it's been a really easy place to get around. Like when I moved here, I used to brag about like, there's never traffic. It's so easy to get around. I think that's kind of over. I think we've grown too much. No, it's the, it's the um, construction is, right there at Tropicana yeah. and, and, and the 15. Can we fix this? But it's it's still, been there for years. Relative to other big cities, it's still very it's easy to get yeah, around. Compared you know, to like somebody's, Austin, yeah. If somebody's on the other side of town, like the furthest they'd be is 30 minutes. Like yeah. that's the furthest anything is. So yeah. it's, it's still relatively easy to get around and it's an entertainment based town. You know, I love that. I love going to shows, but really the, the, the clincher for me is just like the ability to make it's such a beautiful backdrop for videos, and also there's no better place in the world to perform for strangers and videotape it. That seems so, awesome. Yeah. Uh, uh, last question I want to ask you is the barefoot. Like, do you uh -huh. do you still perform barefoot? Where did that come from? Uh, not as much. 
I got did a you lot do of aspire, criticism. Did you do Aspire Barefoot? No, I got okay. a lot of criticism for that on America's Got Talent. And yeah. that did not lead to me putting my shoes back on. But it was just funny that like going barefoot like triggers people. I didn't know that. I just go barefoot in my regular everyday life all the time. I almost oh. never wear shoes. And like a friend of mine observed that in me and was like, oh, you should just perform barefoot because you love being barefoot. And I was like, you can't do that. And then because I thought you can't do that, I was like, well, now I have to do that because like, of course, there's no rules. I should. Um, I think it allowed me to just feel really comfortable on stage, and but I realized it like triggered so many people. I I just thought that was funny in general. People were either curious about it or triggered by it. Um, but I think once I moved to Vegas and I was performing on the street, I was like, it's not an option to perform barefoot. Here. <laughs> yeah, that's like, my, that was my next question. In, yeah, the streets in Vegas, and I did. I filmed a couple videos barefoot in Vegas on Fremont, and it. I mean, this is just really <laughs> it's filthy here. I mean, no, people bro. do. They, bad things to those they streets. They pee on the street. No, yeah, that's so not happening. There's no more barefoot performing because it's just not practical in Vegas. But yeah. I am. I still wear barefoot shoes, and I'm barefoot for most of my life. And I get yelled at at the gym for taking my shoes off. So do you? Do you, which gym do you like? Do you have a gym you know, right here? I go like? to EOS. EOS. Yeah. Okay, I've been to that one. This okay. is easy. Do you ever like go yeah. in there and just make a weight move? I used to go to Powerhouse. I love that gym. It's yeah. like bodybuilding. Rolo gym. goes there. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to Iris. She's she's awesome. I love that gym. I just moved to the other side of town, so it was a lot further for me. But I still think that's the best gym in Vegas. Um, place is awesome. The equipment's so cool. And then you're there surrounded by people who like fitness is their life. Fitness is not my life. It's like yeah. part of my life. But you're surrounded by people where fitness is their life. And so like when you're there, you're really dialed in. Or when I go to EOS, I find it's like easy to slack and look at my phone because everybody else there is just normal people where like you're surrounded by superheroes at powerhouse. So like that's such an inspiring place to go work out, you know, cause we, you just want to be really dialed in yeah. when you're there. When you're in the gym, do you ever use telekinesis and make weights fall down <laughs> no. and shit like that in front no. of people? No, no. no I just get in and get out and do what I got to do. It's like, Hey man, you start lifting, get, pull the tack out of your eye. Like while the dude's sitting there. No, trying but to a lift. gym is a funny world to, uh, to perform in, you know, there's um, a, there's a couple of gyms you want to talk afterwards. Well, they'll let you film. Yeah, I think it would if be. If you cool. want to do Man on the Street, I I know the owner of. It'd like, be really fun to the, go to like Dragon's Lair, like one of these really I'll, fun. I'll talk like, to. I just had Flex on. Uh, yeah. we talk to Flex, or I can talk to. Because uh, it's such a cool. I love worlds. I like filming a video in a world that's just interesting in and of itself. Whether that's the Vegas Strip or the Nitro Car Race, or the I feel like that yeah. gym. I've seen pictures of it. Looks like such a cool world to just bring an audience into. Yeah. Fit Club is so. like that too. Um, there's a gym in Houston where a bunch of influencers. Move Move there, like David Delos Morenos and and uh, Ado Pereira. They said they moved there just so they could film man wow. on the street content in the gym because all the girls were pretty and the gym was like known for oh, being no, like no an influencer gym. or something. Yeah. yeah. So if you ever if you want to do that, dude, I, I know two places immediately that would set you up to, to do that for sure. Cool. Uh, Sounds fun. Uh, what do you have coming up in the future? Uh, it's just some big videos coming out. Yeah. yeah we got uh, one coming out this week. Uh, that's gonna drop, and then we got uh, the blindfold nitro cross video yeah. the week after that, and then we got a lot of other crazy ideas we're filming and starting to film. So, yeah, just just trying to raise the bar, push myself. Really, yeah. it's kind of what it's about in my ability to tell stories, but then also just to do things that I didn't think were possible as far as hypnosis or, yeah, we got some got some fun things coming up. And do you have a weekly live stream? Anything They're like that irregular, do? but I do live stream on YouTube. So on YouTube, yeah. People, have you seen? Have you seen how now they're doing something on Restream or Streamer? I forget where they're going. You can do IG live mm -hmm. along with YouTube. Yeah, along with, yeah. You can multicast. Yeah. I'm choosing right now to just focus on YouTube mm -hmm. to build my audience there. But yeah, multicasting is really interesting. But the live streams happen on the Strip in Vegas. Those are very cool. You know, we have the whole IRL rig, so we're out there with a you know cinema camera on the street, walking up the strangers. You never know what's going to happen because it's the Vegas Strip. And then also like the people in the chat kind of direct me. So they'll be like, okay, go up to the guy in the red sweater or go try to hypnotize that big guy. Or they'll give me ideas like hypnotize this person to like hand over all their valuables or whatever it is. So I kind of make the chat part of the, because it's really an experiment. It's like, what can we do? How far can we push it? So, nice, yeah, it's man. really fun. That's awesome. Where can people find you, man? Uh, everywhere. I'm. It's Max Major. So just, you just type in Max Major on any platform. You can find the you know, videos. If you want to send me a message, Twitter's probably the best place for that. I try to reply to everybody. And then YouTube's the long form stuff that we put a lot more energy into that you might see in the shorts or stuff like that. So 
Awesome, man. Yeah. Hey, let me know. I will definitely go out with you to uh, Fremont. You should come. It's really fun. Yeah. yeah. I, th- I, I get bored sometimes because I'm always at nightclubs to go uh-huh. to Fremont sometimes. But like going out with you seems like that would be a, yeah. it'd be a blast. You won't find me in a nightclub, but on the street, uh, I think it's just as interesting. You don't want to try this at a nightclub? I'll do yeah. the iPhone and we'll do this right behind Dead Mouse. You don't want to? <laughs> it's no? so loud. I don't know how you would. He's like, hey, close your eyes. Yeah, close your eyes. Focus on my voice. Which number? Which card? <laughs> which card is it? Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, man. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you for joining us, man. This is great. I'm really glad to have you on. Uh, guys, make sure you go follow Max. Uh, I think we've described a couple of ideas on the show, but I don't think until you see them, you fully understand. Like, I would highly recommend go look at the uh, uh, America's Got Talent. Go look at the Kaisen Ant one. Uh, you're going to see a bunch of them where it's just like, do you, I can't even get my head 1% of the way there how you did some of the stuff you did. I'm sure I could go on YouTube and somebody would give me a clue to something. I don't even want to know. And I used to be the guy, whenever I'd watch a magician, I'd always look at the backhand. Whenever you're showing me something, yeah. I'm always looking. And I would catch I would catch what they were doing some Well, of the, the interesting times. thing is I just told you how I do everything I do. Yes, that's it. That's correct. So you already have all the answers. The question is just like when am I using what? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's pretty. That's what awesome. makes it fun. All right, guys. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, we got another great episode. I know I'm not doing these every week anymore, but I'm really, really appreciate the fact that there's been so much growth. Thank you guys, all you new people who've joined Men of Action. I really do appreciate that, and I will see all of you next week.